You know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million who's sick on my head. Got a million better put on the road. I just win. I know we got a million dollars. The devil that's it and I chip it again. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the fifth part of What If Deku and Hero Academia Joins One Punch Man. Special note, this fanfic is written in a masterpiece of Lumpaspark3 on fanfiction.net. Do check and support the author too. Now smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. Okay, was all she said stoically. Tatsunaki only rolled her eyes in response and carried Yuraraka back to their training area. The girl was silent the entire time on the journey as she watched the city below her. The scandal, Sweet Mask, Aoyama. Aoyama was currently back in the gym with Sweet Mask. He was teaching him different techniques on how to punch and kick. Lucky not on him, but on a punching bag instead. Aoyama made note that the moves he was teaching him were all fierce strikes that would require him to throw his entire body weight into the blow, increasing the damage the receiver would be dealt. The leg strikes he tried to teach him were even more unnerving, stating to strike the opponent in the ligaments that would be most likely to cripple them or at the very least throw them off balance. He was forced to do countless reps of the same strike over and over again until Sweet Mask deemed the strike sufficient. Being not being used to fighting hand-to-hand -hand Aoyama constantly struggled to live up to Sweet Mask expectations making strike the punching bag numerous times even as his hands began to blister or perform kicks until his legs began to clamp up. Even when Sweet Mask had to step out to go to one of his many appointments for his numerous talents, he would constantly keep an eye on him with the cameras in the room. If he tried to slack off even once, he would personally give Aoyama a live demonstration of the technique, the target being himself instead of the punching bag. The blow was extremely painful and flung him back into the ropes, but even after the blow, Sweet Mask didn't give him much time to rest, hauling him to his feet and demanding that he continue even more with his repetitions. Part of him was confused on why Sweet Mask would have him even learn hand-to-hand -hand techniques when his quirk was primarily based on range, he was only told that this was necessary for him to survive. He also remembered the other day. How he said that he wouldn't have the luxury of always staying at range, even his counter to that was only a half measure. He didn't know how to properly use his naval saber and he rarely trained with it, so this training could prove beneficial just in case. His repetitions were stopped briefly opening of the door. Multiple people began to come in, lifting large rectangular objects after taking the packaging off, he realized that they were mirrors. They began to put the large mirrors up scattered about the room, somewhere full body sized, others were chest tall and every size in between. He suddenly received a text on his phone from none other than his teacher that just read. Who told you that you can stop? The text frightened him. He almost threw his phone back into the seat and went back towards the punching bag, keeping at it as the people around set up the multitude of mirrors. The workers all left the room and around 45 minutes later Sweet Mask entered the room. The ring was all he said seriously as he walked in putting down his jacket. Aoyama only compiled and made his way towards the ring embracing himself for what was about to come. He suddenly felt his right shoulder burst in pain flinging him from the center of the ring slamming into the corner. He opened his eyes to see his shoulder plate have a big dent in it. His whole right arm felt numb. Come on, stand up we don't have all day. I have another meeting in a couple hours and I need to prepare. Sweet Mask said casually pointing to the spot he wanted to stand. Aoyama just compiled starting over to the place designated facing the hero waiting to be addressed testing his arm to see the extent of the damage. I have been thinking of your ability. You call it a laser, does that mean it has similar properties? He inquired looking at his reflection in the mirror. Um, I don't know. I know that it holds some light properties because one of my classmates can bend light and she was able to redirect it. Ayama replied nervously. Good enough, I want you to fire your quirk at that mirror in front of us. Not even questioning the hero he did as he was told and fired his naval laser at the object and the mirror was completely destroyed and shattered to the ground. He immediately felt a pain on the back of his head. Idiot, not at full power. 
Sweet Mask said condescendingly. Simply nodding his head, he aimed at another mirror and, understanding of what the hero was getting at, shot an extremely low-powered beam at it, and it successfully reflected off and hit somewhere behind him. Good, good. It was just as I thought. If you will be able to master using your ability like this, then the telegraph of your hips will no longer be an issue. Sweet Mask said in thought. Aoyama was at a loss for words. This does open up plenty of opportunities to him and allows him to change the direction of his beam if necessary. Well, Sweet Mask said expectantly, leaving the young hero confused. Don't you have something you want to say to me? Sweat Mask asked expectantly. Aoyama was confused for some seconds more until it dawned on him. Thank you, Sweet Mask. I wouldn't have thought of something like this myself. Aoyama said, bowing his head. You're right about that. I hate seeing talent wasted, and if you are going to be seen next to me, I would prefer it if you have at least some skill. Now from now on you will also add reflections to your training reps. For every mirror you break, punishment will be awarded. Understand? Ayama gulped and nodded his head in understanding. Now, I want you to be able to reflect your laser off of all the mirrors in this room. The last reflection aiming towards yourself. Understood? Aoyama was shocked at what he asked of him was practically impossible to do. The angle and trajectory would prove so much to account for the nine mirrors in this place, he counted. But he didn't voice any of his complaints, only nodding his head in confirmation. So he tried. He first wanted to at least accomplish reflecting his laser off two mirrors before worrying about anything else. Over numerous times of trial and error, he finally managed to reflect his laser off one mirror to the other. He wanted to make sure he got the angle correct and fired multiple more lasers in that same direction, figuring out how much room he had to work with to reflect towards the next mirror. It had taken him and one hour to accomplish this much and Sweet Mask had came and went a few times between them. He was currently watching as he was trying to narrow down hitting the third mirror, but before he could, someone had bursted into the room, he held a pad in his hands and handed it to Sweet Mask. Judging by the slight glare on his face, he assumed the news to be bad. He thanked the gentleman for showing him this and dismissed him. Now that he was alone he just sat angrily mumbling something under his breath as he continued to look at the pad in his hands. He was so engrossed that he didn't even realize that Aoyama had closed in and looked at what was on the pad. It was a police report of something that happened during the day. The title read Hero Association Using Monsters. As he scanned the details he skipped over the text as he couldn't read much from his angle, but there was a picture attached that showed a girl and guy in tank tops, next to, he gasped, which finally shook Sweet Mask from his musings. Who told you that you could stop? He sneered but Aoyama ignored him. I, that man is my friend, he's not a monster, Aoyama exclaimed. He suddenly was hoisted in the air by Sweet Mask. Explain, he said with venom. Remember when I said that my classmates all had power and abilities? Some of them manifested as mutations changing how they looked on the outside. That right there in the picture is Shoji, he can create different appendages with his dupli arms. He said, holding his hands in front of his face. Until he suddenly dropped back down, he looked at Sweet Mask which was face palming while looking upwards. Releasing a breath he turned to face the teen and the S-Class were assigned them, explaining why he's with the tank tops. Does one of them have a bird head and the other is completely invisible? Yes, Tokoyami and Toru. Okay, so those pictures were true. All right, I just need to get ahead of this. Thinking for 30 seconds he turned to the young hero. Since your friends were assigned to the S-Class, is it safe to assume that one of them works under King? Ayama nodded his head in reply. Good, King is a tricky person to get a hold of, so I need you to persuade whoever that is under him to get King to agree to an interview, sometime next month. I need time to get a story straight and explain you all. Make sure he agrees, he said menacingly, his veins bulging from his neck, symbolizing his agitation. Yeah, yes sir, Aoyama was so frightened that he saluted the hero, which in return only received a strange look. I will assume that was a swear or promise gesture either way. Your training is not done, get back to it. He pointed back to the center of the ring and Aoyama quickly obliged, hopefully thinking that Maita could get King to agree as quickly as possible. Fun and games, King, Maita. 
he was lost and scattered from his partner. Minto was alone fighting his way through a horde of monsters and other abominations that blocked his route. He bounded from place to place as fast he could. The place seemed to be an unending maze. He started scavenging weapons from the fallen around him gathering a sword and shield that he would use to defend himself from the inevitable creatures that were hell-bound and chasing him to the ends of the earth and turned an abandoned street corner just to run face first into a skeleton creature. It was a massive creature over four meters tall with, with metal armor covering most of its body besides its face. He tried to fight it swimming his sword at the creature. The creature didn't even flinch letting the blade bounce harmlessly off his armor. It laughed at his futile attempt but backed away regardless it launched wave of minions at him instead a bunch of human-like skeletons began to rise from the ground sporting swords and shields some even sporting old-school weapons like flintlocks and blunderbusses that were used back in the days of pirates. The small skeleton army began to approach his position, forcing him back as he attempted to defend and parry strikes from the skeletons that rushed him with blades. He was not having much luck suffering small cuts every now and then as the onslaught continued. He used his balls to create some space sticking his targets in place and giving him some space to maneuver, but as he backed up to asses his options he was under fire by the range units, mostly missing due to him bounding around the area. He attempted to throw some balls at them to incapacitate, but most of his attacks missed their mark. The big guy came back, equipping what appeared to be a giant crossbow from across his back and loading it with an arrow. Minta had found some cover behind a large rock from the skeleton's range units, but as he looked from around his cover and saw the large arrow making its way towards him he decided. He had to jump out of the way meanwhile the arrow completely destroyed the rock he was hiding behind. He was now exposed to the skeleton's range units, they immediately fired upon him. Him being in the open left his options minimal, but to minimize his size as small as possible a lot of the shots missed, but enough landed to almost cripple him. He was now struggling to move as the giant creature had reloaded his crossbow and began to take aim again. He saw his life flash before his eyes, everyone that would miss him, all the girls he hadn't got a chance to meet. He swore that he could hear his own heart beat over all the noise that surrounded him, but he realized something. What he was hearing it wasn't his heartbeat, but a battle cry, and to him it was an angel sent by the gods. As the beating grew louder the boss took aim at him and shot his oversized crossbow. It would have been dead on target if it wasn't for one man. A man dropped from the sky causing dust to spray into the air from where he landed. The arrow destined for him was reflected as he saw it strike the big guy instead. The man was king and his engine was roaring. He couldn't even see what happened as he dispatched the small army of thirty skeletons in the complete blink of an eye. Their bones were scattered to the wind as he passed through them with such ease. He approached the boss directly. The boss swung at him with his a dagger as but King was so fast that he evaded the blow and stuck with his fist completely pushing the boss back. He followed with a flip kick to the jaw. The big guy staggered back and summoned more skeletons and retreated but King didn't give it the chance. Moving at incredible speed he destroyed the skeletons before they had a chance to completely rise from the ground. Reaching the boss in a split second and driving an uppercut so strong that it completely bisected the big guy in half. The screen then darkened stating victory on the screen as the boss dropped loot from its corpse. Wow, King, you're really good at this game. Do you play a lot? Minta asked curiously. Yeah, you could say something like that. King replied sheepishly not wanting to reveal how much time he spent on this game. Still, I don't know how I feel about just being bait all the time. Why can't we go back and just fight enemies on my level instead? No, no, no it's fine, you need to do at least some damage to the enemies so that you can get some of the exp from when I defeat them. Just look at how many levels you got from this, you grew 15 levels from just one mission. King argued. Minta couldn't argue that this way got results very quickly, and speaking of results very quickly. Aren't you going to go out and fight monsters today? Minta asked with anticipation in his voice. No, ugh not today, King said hesitantly. Ah, why not? Minta said disappointed in not being able to see the strongest man in action. It's just too much for me. Honestly I'm not the best at social interactions really and every time I step outside the house I'm mobbed by fans or met with some crazy monster. It's just tiring after a while. King said solemnly. What? 
I would be dying to be in your position besides the crazy monsters part having dedicated fans cheering you on and asking for autographs seems like a dream come true for me, especially if there's some cute ladies if you know what I mean. Minter replied with a wink at the end. King merely rolled his eyes at the kid's tactics, while being a celebrity did have his perks. They come with a skew of drawbacks that no one likes to mention. Being a public figure is a lot of work, especially if what you're known for is revealed as an exaggerated lie. I would be careful what you wish for. King replied simply before grabbing another game and putting it in. This one was a fighting game. Wanna practice with me in this? It has a tournament next week actually, you should try joining. Why? There's no way I can get good at this game in barely a week of play, no matter how good of a teacher you may be at it. Even if you're not good with the controller, there is an alternative method to play where you can use your body to control the character. King replied. What? No way. That sounds so cool, the purple boy said happily. Yeah, it's good, as long as the machine can read your movements, that is, something too fast or too complex would probably end up breaking it he said nonchalantly. Oh, so you're gonna enter using the controller king, Minta asked. Yup, no point in moving away from the basics. So you wanna try, King said offering the ten a controller. Sure. Minta agreed, accepting the controller. Deliberations, Class 1A. Just like before the class met up in the common room to discuss the day's events. The discussion was mostly headed by Momo this time in place of Ada due to him being gone for the month. Everyone broke off into groups to talk amongst those who they were closest to. Midoriya noticed how Yuraraka was a bit off recently in the conversation, not wanting to speak about her day with the number two heroine much, while everyone else spoke almost freely about their day. Most discussion revolved around the large group of students that were requested elsewhere. Kirishima was the first to answer the question. It turns out Demon Cyborg had a virtual machine full of monsters he wanted our teachers to fight and said something about collecting battle data for something. He wanted to use the data to make himself stronger. Takoyami completed. Right, there was this big beetle thing that beat almost everyone besides two of them, Toru exclaimed excitedly. Takoyami nodded. Whatever it was, it was indeed strong me and Bakugo could only last a few seconds at best. Todoroki only did slightly better, lasting around a minute and a half. Takoyami said, remembering the beast from earlier that day. Making almost everyone in the class turn and look at only Bakugo in surprise, Todoroki not being in the common room at the time having left early after ensuring that he was alright. Their stares only served to aggravate him as he made a sharp reply. Don't any of you extras look down on me. Demon Cyborg said that anyone below that of a class would be a waste of time to try. You guys probably wouldn't even last a second. Just get on to the actual interesting information. He remarked, making the class turn back to Kirishima when he didn't elaborate further. Oh, right, get this. Demon Cyborg somehow got into Todoroki and Bakugo Mines. The machine had data on All Might, the Namus, and Endeavor. This revelation shocked the class. I hope he had both of your approval for such a thing to happen. Momo remarked softly. He didn't. The Megaman ripoff was the one that knocked us out the other day in fact. He stole the data while we were unconscious. Bakuo replied angrily, shocking the class even more and causing murmurs to spread through the room of how awful of him for him to do such a thing. What? Mina shouted. We can't just let him get away with doing that. There must be some rules or laws that he must have broken to do that to you both. Momo said standing up. Cool your jets, ponytail. If I have a problem I'll handle it myself, you got that? He remarked coldly, making her sit back down. Well, what about you Tsu? I heard from the rest that you were taken somewhere by yourself. What did they have you do? Toru asked the girl. They, they had me talk to one of their captive monsters. Gaining the attention of the class almost immediately, she explained what they told her about monsterization in people here and how they wanted to see if she could calm him down to cooperate with their efforts to reintroduce him back into society, since she has similar abilities to him. I don't know if I got through to him or not, but I did save his life by not calling for what was sure to be an execution squad in for help when he attacked me. Hopefully he listened. Ribbit. The amount of information was hard to take in for a lot of the class, humans that would transform if they simply believed in something strong enough. 
This world has something crazier and crazier each day. Midoriya noticed that upon hearing Tsu's story Yuraraka's body seems to deflate even more. He did too, and was curious if it was for the same reason so he tested his hypothesis. Yuraraka, did you have an encounter with monsters today? Midoriya asked, shocking the girl back to the conversation at hand with everyone looking at her. Yeah, I did. She said absently replaying the events in her mind. Did your hero kill the monster? Midoriya continued looking at her worriedly. Monsters, there were three of them, brothers, she replied softly. The same thing happened with me and bang on our first encounter, causing the girl to look towards Midoriya as he understood what she was going through. Me as well, during patrol I encountered a monster that I defeated but was killed by the tank tops. Ida was correct the heroes here have no problem with killing their problems away, Shoji added on. The atmosphere became quiet as they let that fact finally sink in and there was a hesitancy for more conversation to start. Midoriya stood up to address the class. We may not be able to change them, but that doesn't mean we need to change ourselves. Killing is not an option for us and going off of what Asui just said about the association they don't mind capturing monsters instead of killing them and that is what we will do. That's what the word hero means to us, not only saving citizens, but also saving villains from themselves. Midoriya said the last part and looked at Yuraraka, which bettered her mood, significantly nodding in his direction while everyone began to clap their hands and shout their agreement. With that out of the way the mood returned as others mentioned their day, lightening the mood somewhat before everyone set out to go to bed. Ayama held Maita back for a moment to talk to him privately, garnering suspicion from the small teen as the two never really interacted before or have anything in common from the few conversations he overheard involving him. You're learning under Mr. King, correct? Ayama started. Right, what about it? Did he want some sort of autograph or was he jealous? Maita wondered. I'm training under Sweet Mask and he was wondering if you could manage to get to agree to an interview sometime next month. Minta sat and thought about it. He remembered what the magazine said about King and what he said about himself and became skeptical. I don't think King wants to do interviews anytime soon. He's kind of a shut-in. Minta replied, rubbing the back of his head. But he stepped back at the seriousness of Aoyama's reply. You must convince him it is of the utmost importance that he agrees to the interview. He began to scroll on his phone as Minta replied. What do you mean? What's so important about a random interview? This, he said, showing him his phone from the police report from earlier on in the day. Minter read it and saw the picture, and it started to dawn on him. They think some of us are monsters just because we look different, and you heard of what they do to monsters in this world. Shoji was shot at by the police, with Sweet Mask and King's help. We can hopefully prevent other incidents from happening before something really does happen. He said seriously towards his small friend who shook a little from the intense glare. Sure, I'll do what I can. Leave it to me. Minta said, retaining his self-control. Please, make sure you do. Aoyama and Minta left the common area towards their rooms. As the class was walking out of the common area Momo stopped Midoriya before they could get towards the hallway to the dorms. Yuraraka almost stopped along with them, but after a look from Midoriya decided to keep going on with the others. That was a great speech back there Midoriya, and I agree with it wholeheartedly, but I wanted to talk to you about Todoroki. Yeah, I'm worried about him too. I was going to check up on him now actually. Actually I wanted to do so myself. You already went above and beyond with that speech, but as acting class president, I want to do my best for them as well. She said with conviction, Midoriya glanced at her determined face and decided to honor her request showing her his room and wishing her luck as he went into his door. Momo began to get some jitters as she approached his door, but steeled herself to make sure her classmate was okay. She knocked on the door and waited. No response. She knocked again and nothing. She started to mentally smack herself of course he was asleep. He was probably tired from the day's events and she was being a pee. Yayarazu, Tataroki's voice drew her out of her thoughts. She quickly turned to face him her face flushing somewhat. Todoroki, I had thought you went towards your room. I just went to clear my head, he said solemnly. Do you want to talk about it? I heard what the demon cyborg did to you and Bakugo. Todoroki hesitated a moment, considering his options before gesturing for her to follow him, 
She took some time as she went to the kitchen to make some tea. The spot Todoroki chose to sit by was a window that had a view of the lake under the city. She laid out the tea in front of Todoroki and herself as she sat down, brining a tiny smirk to his face. You really do love your tea, don't you? Todoroki joked. Yes, I find tea can be very helpful to alleviate stress. Momo answered seriously. They both took a sip of the tea as Momo waited for Todoroki to speak up. I'm not mad about what the demon cyborg did, well not entirely it was highly immoral, but that's nothing new to me. He had a somewhat tangible reason for doing so however. It would seem that the S-Class were pressured into taking us if they didn't want to. I see, he just wanted the best information possible without any chances of falsehood. But if you're not too angered about that then what is troubling you? she asks sincerely. Todoroki let out a deep breath as he started. It was when he mentioned my father, it reminded me of what we left back in our world in such a crucial moment. My father is under such scrutiny for Datoya. But if the news catch whiff of him losing me let alone our entire class disappearing, it would put even more pressure on him and cause more distrust of the heroes that remain active. Momo let him speak about his worries, but she had absolutely nothing she could say to comfort him. She had completely got lost in all the happenings of this world before worrying about their own. She was shaking as she pictured the thoughts of her parents and what they're going through with her absence. Did they think she was dead? What if they can't go back and stay here forever? No, she couldn't think that she had to be more hopeful that things will turn out okay. Focusing on the negative will only hurt them in the long term and she needed to tell him that. Taking her silence as a sign to continue he went on. That's why I decide if I ever encounter that being again, I'll try and get us back no matter the cost," he said with sincerity. This immediately snapped Momo from her thoughts as she reached out, put a hand on top of Todoroki and squeezed lightly. Don't say that. That being's gifts are nothing but trouble. He may give you what you want, but it will be at yours and relatively our expense. If we can return I would like for all of us to return together," she said with a saddened smile. How do you know we will be able to go back home? Todoroki questioningly. I don't, but I have faith that we can come up with something. We just need to wait and I'm sure an opportunity will come. And if one never comes? Then we will see when we get there. Everyone wants to go back home, but getting home without everyone would only be a shallow victory. Just have some patience and don't do anything rash until we truly exhausted all other options. We need to take care of each other while we're here she said, meeting his eyes as she spoke. Todoroki gave her a smile in return. You're right, we should deal with what's in front of us first and do anything we can to keep each other safe until we can go back. She smiled happily as she managed to brighten his mood, then flushed as she still held her hand on top of his, which she quickly removed, her face having a slight blush to it. Hey, anyway, I think it would be best if we go get some rest, who knows what we're going to have to deal with tomorrow. She said quickly standing and taking the dishes away, Todoroki helped her clean them and then both teens left to go to bed. Todoroki thanked her for the tea and they talked a little more before both heading into their respective rooms. Hero up, class 1A. Shoji woke up in the morning and was surprised to find a suit in front of his door, with a note attached to it. The note read, if you are to continue with your hero duties wear this, it's an high-tech mesh that would cloak your arms or other duplicated appendages in a metallic shine. Shoji looked at the suit for a moment examining it. It was a jet-gray upper body costume that cut off at the neck. He tried the suit on and found that it fit like a glove covering over most of his arms, but leaving his two normal arms exposed, he tried using his quirk with it on a found that it wasn't restrictive at all. The fabric stretched along with his new arms, and like the letter said it made the arms look more mechanical than physical to the casual observer. He tapped his additional appendage and found that it even felt more mechanical than physical. If the arms weren't directly connected to him, even he would think that they were made of metal instead of flesh. He wanted to now test other options besides fists. He first attempted to use extra eyes and was shocked that he could actually see through the metal. They took the appearance of just metallic circles instead of human eyes. He tried ears next and unlike with eyes, the texture bent around the shape of the ear giving the imprint of it from the outside perspective. He tried to listen in and see if he could hear the same as before, which he could, 
the only difference being a slight whirring sound that was so silent that it could easily be drowned out by mostly anything else around him. Feeling satisfied that he won't be impaired by the tech suit he put on his tank top on top of it and continued out towards the common room with everyone else. He was surprised to see a similar tech suit on Ojiro's tail. Approaching his friend he asked about it. You received the same letter as well, I assume? Ojiro took a glance behind him and saw Shoji in his top tech suit. Yeah, people here aren't used to people with tails, so this was their idea to calm them down, make my tail look more machine than man. So it looks more believable, I guess. Ojiro shrugged. Any problems with flexibility? Shoji asked. Nope, I can barely feel it, if I'm being honest. What about you won't it get in the way of using your quirk? Ojiro questioned. I thought it would but the technology here is remarkable, it seems, no difficulty at all. Shoji replied by demonstrating creating multiple arms from his back. As everyone started to file into the common room, the same question was asked again and again upon seeing the two, with each addition. But a surprise came in when Takoyami came into the room. Well they assumed it was Takoyami given the head shape. The teen that came in had a mask on that looked bird-shaped colored all black with a non-transparent visor on the top near the eyes colored a dark purple. Kaminari thought the helmet looked familiar to a bird version of that guy from Code Zero. You're going for a new look Takoyami, Ribbit. Asui commented. Dark shadow came out and tapped the button on the side of his helmet. The helmet began to retract, turning into a sort of mask that covered the lower part of his face and beak. Apparently the association doesn't like my appearance very well and ordered me to wear this for hero activities he said casually. He likes it, don't worry. Dark Shadow added. Well, in any case, hopefully people can become more accepting of our more unique and magnifique classmates. Ayama said with a smile and a subtle look at Minta. The class went about the day again when another abnormality entered the fray they didn't know. Everyone just stared at the girl in the doorway. She was a white girl with white hair and blue eyes. Hi, everyone. The girl said timidly with a wave, the voice and the inside of her mouth gave the girl away. Almost the entire class screamed her name in shock. Toru? Yeah, it's me, she answered somewhat shyly. What happened to you? Mina practically screeched as she went to examine the girl from up close. Well, the association didn't want an invisible girl on the streets doing hero work so they made me this. It's essentially a skin suit that can mimic the human skin tone enhanced contacts that can move with my eyes, and a bald cap with special enhanced fibers, along with body paint, she said shyly. Wait a bald cap, you're saying you had hair this entire time, mind a question which got him a poke in the ear from Gyro, sending the small boy rolling on the floor in pain. What the idiot probably means to say is that how you look normally, Gyro asked. Oh, oh, is it, is it? Mina almost jumping up and down beside her. Yeah, I got as close as possible to how I normally look. I can change the color of my skin, eyes, and hair if I want to actually. The girl said shyly, looking around the class and seeing some other additions on other mutant types. Wow, well what are you going to do now? Being invisible was kind of was your only thing. Kaminari mentioned but before Gyro Earjax could reach he received a smack on the back of the head by Ojiro with his tail. Oh, what I say, Kaminari said while rubbing the back of his head. It's about what you shouldn't have said, Ojiro said stoically. Turning to meet the eyes of Toru, he flushed and looked away and continuing to speak. While basic on the surface all of our quirks can be used in unique ways that some wouldn't think of right away. He's right even if you are no longer invisible, you can still do that shining light thing right, Deku mentioned. Toru nodded in reply. Right. And don't forget if her powers were just being invisible, you wouldn't be around right now, bro. Kirishima remarked to Kaminari. He's right. This is actually a pretty good time for you to focus on your light, manipulating abilities since being invisible is no longer an option. Momo suggested. I'll give it a try. Toru replied, the morning routine is like usual, everyone getting ready for their day with their hero. Lost Cat, Gino's group. Tank Tops, Yayurazu, Shoji. The teens were just about done in the common area when this time a complete stranger entered through the door. Going by his outfit they speculated it to be someone from the association, he wore the traditional black dress uniform and had glasses with an undercut hairstyle. 
being the president of the class Yayorazu was the first to speak to the individual. Good morning, sir. What brings you here? She asked politely. Good morning, madam. I'm here to inform the heroes working under Tank Top Master and Demon Cyborg of their current situation. I would be pleased if we could discuss these matters alone, if you all don't mind. The gentleman said with a slight bow and a sly smile. Is there something wrong? Midoriya asked, slightly worried. No, no nothing if I can help it, the details of which are only being discussed with those who need to know. The man said assuredly to the teen. The teens gave a hesitant look to their classmates as they walked out of the room, and as soon as the last person was out the agent looked at the remaining teens in the room. He looked over to Shoji and began to speak. I assume that you are the C-class hero tentacle correct? I hope the tech suit is to your liking, he said calmly. Before replying Bakugo quickly interfered. Hurry it up, no need to act like you care, what did you want to talk about, he said, slightly agitated. Only receiving a slight chuckle from the agent in question, skipping over the pleasantries his body language changed into a more stern state. I stopped you all today, due to your teachers really, I've currently assigned the tank tops to civilian evacuation. I will take you to them. That doesn't explain us, Bakugo remarked. You two are under Genos, I assume. Well, I will be back for you two at a later time and take you to him. For now you have the morning and much of the early evening free to do as you may. I will be back for you and take you to your mentor as well. We have a mission for him. With that said the agent took Shoji and began to escort him to his car. The drive was pretty silent as they made their way to a residential district, only to be greeted with multiple tank toppers minus master. They both began to step out of the car and went to conversate with the tank tops. How does the evacuation go? The agent asked tank top vegetarian. It's going fine as expected. We're getting the rest of the stragglers now. Tank vegetarian said as he looked over to Shoji and a small snarl gracing his face. Philosopher, your pet monster is here. He said with somewhat antagonistically. There is no need to yell. I'm right here and please refrain from calling our new recruit a monster. Master was pretty clear to treat him as one of us. I hope I won't have to report your behavior. Philosopher said from behind him frightening him slightly and earning a glare from vegetarian. Once everyone is evacuated, I want you all to place guards on all four corners of the area to make sure no one enters. The agent told them. Me and Shoji will handle the west exit. It's the furthest entrance from the city, so I assume you wouldn't mind the monster being away from you. Philosopher mockingly mentioned, earning another glare from the vegetarian before he turned and walked away stating, Fine by me. I don't want anyone bringing down the name of the tank top, and if we can avoid any more rumors the better. Shoji was a bit confused by the interaction but decided to ignore it for the moment. He went along with Philosopher into the city searching for more people to evacuate using his quirk that allowed them to find numerous individuals that were still lagging behind and help them away from the area. Shoji received numerous looks from the people he helped. Some were even scared and tried to run away from him when he only wanted to help. Others asked straight up about him being a monster to which he refused. A teenager suggested that he pulled off a good prank by pretending his metal arms were real before and asked him about the trick to which he had no real answer but decided to go along saying that he could make his arms look real if he wanted to. Now Shoji and Philosopher stood by the west exit. It was an extremely boring task but it left Shoji time to ponder about his experience and the strange conversations people brought up about him. What even happened here to require people to evacuate? Shoji asked Philosopher. I don't really know, the agent you were with only talked to Master who then relayed to us what tasks were to be done. When we were told that we're getting paid by the hour for this project the tank tops hardly cared for what the purpose of the evacuation was. He said shrugging. I see, was all Shoji replied with a bit astonished by the group's complicity. Going by your reactions earlier, you don't seem to know of the report that was done on you by the police? Philosopher inquired. What? What did the report say about me? Shoji answered with extreme curiosity. It tried to play you as a monster and they wanted to use you as evidence that the association is creating their own monsters and sending out heroes to defeat them to boost their own standing. The article is not directed towards you, but just an attempt for the police to gain at least some footing again. Philosopher answered. Shoji didn't reply. 
he was consumed by his thoughts on how that made everything make sense, the new tech suit, and how the people reacted to him in the area. The police didn't even bother asking for any comment from the association and only looked to shame them which apparently worked as they had made immediate efforts to less monsterify him and his classmates. Don't worry about it too much, the association is planning a response to the allegations sometime next month I believe, going off sweet masks interviews. Do you think it will make anything better? Shoji questioned. Probably, he holds a lot of power over the media and masses. If anything I'm more worried about the police once the backlash starts," he said chuckingly mildly to himself. Why did the association and police come to be at each other's throats in the first place, Ajiro inquired. That's a tale lost to time, I assume it was due to the loose nature of the association versus the more rigid confines of police work. Those often not fit enough to be a hero become a police officer instead which can also add a bit of envy and jealousy to the mix of business. Interesting. Was all Shoji managed to say as Philosopher suddenly snapped his head forwards? Doing the same Shoji noted a couple of individuals approaching the gate, there were five in total three of which sported weapons of some kind. Shoji braced himself ready to fight before they got closer, and he recognized one of them. Momo and Kaminari arrived inside Drive Knight's lair proceeding towards their practice area. Surprisingly the area seemed to be rearranged from previously their practice area was in front of the storage area near the large PC screen from earlier. As they approached Drive Knight turned to look at them. Good, you two have arrived. Today will be similar to yesterday for you Chargebolt, but you on the other hand creationists have a special experience planned for today. What do you have in mind for me? Momo questioned suspiciously. While going over numerous forms and exercises are beneficial. I would like for you to learn from someone with true combat experience. What? Why does Momo get to have the cool stuff? Kaminari whined. Really? Who would that be? Just as she was about to speak there was a sound from behind her signaling that someone had walked in through the door. That should be him right now. A man approached them from the darkness. He had a suit that seemed to be made of black bandages with a crown of dark spiky black hair. He carried a spear weapon with a large spearhead. Yo, the name's Stinger, he said holding up two fingers to his head in greeting. He was the hero with the closest compatibility towards staff combat, while not entirely the same you can learn a lot from watching him in action. Drive Knight said to the girl. My bamboo shoot spear and I are pretty amazing, but we got to go quickly, we already received our mission and we're gonna have to meet up with everyone else. He said while rubbing the handle of his spear. You should go don't worry about your friend here, he will be kept safe, as you should be. Drive Knight said, looking at Stinger. Don't worry about it, short of a demon it will be a piece of cake. He said, twirling his spear in his hands. Yayurazu shot one more quick glance at Kaminati, and he shot her a thumbs up signaling that it was cool. Taking a deep breath she continued along with Stinger towards the door before being stopped by Drive Knight calling out to her and throwing her a small device. She pressed the button in the center and the device extended out into a full-length staff, it was a bit thicker than the one they trained with before, but only slightly heavier than she would have suspected. Pressing the button again she turned back around to follow Stinger away. As the two were walking away from the facility Stinger decided to make some small talk. So girl what's your name? Your hero name, that is, there is no need to tell me your real name if you don't want to. He said, carrying his spear behind his neck. It's no problem at all, my name is Yayurazu, but my hero name is Creati Creationist, stuttering on her new hero name. Oh cool, going by what Drive Knight gave you, I guess your primary weapon is a staff. Well I'm not one to judge, but you should definitely think about using a spear instead, much more killing power you know? He said casually, turning to look at her as he held the collapsible staff in her hand, inspecting it and putting it in one of her waist pockets. Well I appreciate the advice, I'm not that in favor of killings things so I'll stick with the staff for now, and while the staff is one of the weapons I'm most proficient with, my main talent lies in my ability to create things. She said smiling and using her quirk to make a concrete shield making the hero in front of her almost stop in his tracks gawking at her. Whoa, I guess they call you the creationist for a reason huh? What else can you create? Can you create something like money or clones of yourself? He asked stepping a little too close to her liking. She took a step back and answered him. 
I can't just create anything, only non-living things or objects. I first need to know its molecular structure and how it goes together. While I can create money technically, that is very much against everything I stand for as a hero, so I don't do it. Sheesh, I see you're a bookworm in more ways than one. I'm guessing that your power requires open skin as well cause there's no way a bookworm would dress like that on purpose. He said, giving a cheeky smile before turning around and walking again. Leaving a conflicted Momo in his wake. Don't worry about onlookers, most of the people who we're about to meet are professionals, they're all a part of the A-class, what class are you anyways? Um, well C-class, she said shyly. C-class, huh? Well don't let that get you down, I'm sure with your power you can move up pretty quickly, it only took me six months to get to where I am now, and I'm still gonna go farther all the way to S, he said enthusiastically. The two continued to walk and talk until they got into a residential area. They began to approach, three other individuals one in a gas mask and skis, one a blonde with a ponytail with an upside-down peach headband, and lastly a dark-skinned man with a bald head and big lips. What took you so long, Stinger? The man in the gas mask and goggles said. Calm down, Genji, I just had to pick up a stray along the way. If an S-class asks for a favor then you do it. Let me introduce you to Creationist, and Creationist this is Lighting Genji, Peach Terry, and Heavy Kong. Each gave a greeting in return as Stinger introduced them. She's here to witness me be awesome and learn a thing or two, if she is not mesmerized by my awesomeness first, he boasted. Well, if anything she can learn how to not behave like you, Peach Terry commented. Indeed, while I value your strength in combat, your personality seems to be a bit much, Heavy Kong added. Whatever you guys are just mad that I'm more popular than you all, let's get the show on the road, he said moving forward, everyone moving behind him. The group walked further into the rural area coming upon the edge of the designated area of their target. The group got to the hero checkpoint where two heroes stood in front of an entry barrier. Momo realized who one of them was and moved towards the front of the group to greet him. Shoji, what are you doing here? Momo asked. I could ask you the same thing. The tank tops were charged with protecting this area from intruders. While everything can be settled, what about you? I don't actually know, but I assume there is some threat in there that we're going to neutralize, Momo said looking over her head at the group behind her. Only receiving a glare in return from Heavy Kong, but it wasn't directed at her but Shoji. Do you know that hero? She asked slightly quieter than before. No, but I have an idea of his problem, turns out. The police thought I was a monster that the association is using to fight, causing the girl to gasp. Meanwhile, the group of heroes were talking to tank philosophers, who said they couldn't get in under orders of the association, but Lighting Max produced a piece of paper from the same association member allowing them entry. So that's what this is philosopher thought to himself as he let the group through. Before moving through Heavy Kong approached Shoji and looked at his metallic arms. You know it's not funny to joke around like that kid, monsters are a menace to society we can't be seen associating with them. You should keep those arms of yours like that so people won't get the wrong impression. He commented as he passed, putting a hand on the boy's shoulder. Understood. Was all Shoji said in reply. Momo was shocked by the interaction, wanting more details from her classmate before being called over by Stinger. Go ahead, I'll tell you guys about it later, be safe in there. Shoji said. Momo nodded and continued on with everyone else. Is that a childhood friend of yours? Tank philosopher asked. Something like that, a classmate from school. Shoji commented. Oh I see, well I can imagine we'll meet some other soon as well. He mentioned coyly flashing a sly smile as he looked into his book as Shoji stared at him suspiciously. The group were walking down the center of the street with Stinger in the lead walking casually with his spear behind his neck. He spoke to the group as he continued forward. Interesting, there are two of them. Do you guys know anything about that? He asked as he walked forward. No, the agent mentioned only one pet, not pets plural. Genji said as he continued to walk forward. Hopefully this unknown variable doesn't make this mission above our expertise. Heavy Kong said, slightly balding his fist. Seeing the confusion on the girl's face, Peach Terry addressed her. Miss Creationist, we are currently being hunted by two monsters. Don't give yourself away by turning to look at them. Simply be ready for a fight. 
the man said calmly. She understood and tried to calm her nerves that were lighting up her body. Don't worry man, I'm sure we got this. Creati, can you make us some smoke bombs? Stinger said confidently as he strode forward. Um, I, uh, yes I can, she said somewhat nervously. Good, I want you to move to the center of the formation and wait for my signal. Not too fast, we don't want to give anything away. Stinger said as they continued walking, doing as she was instructed, she went towards the center of the group and created two smoke bombs. She tried to slyly look around to see the danger, but couldn't see anything until she noticed movement from between the houses and an eye that was staring at them as they moved on. Suddenly Stinger signaled for the group to stop moving and turned to face them. The atmosphere was tense, he held up three fingers then two and finally one. Once the last finger went down, he yelled now which Momo assumed was the signal as she threw the smoke bombs on the ground, she had monstrous growls from each side of her. As the smoke clouded her vision, she suddenly felt weightless as she was carried by Stinger through the air and placed down a few meters away from the smoke. Each individual of their party surrounded the smoke which was suddenly blown away, giving her vision of the quarry that had been stalking them for however long. They were cat-like beings that stood up like humans. They were much larger than normal, almost 30 ft tall, with an abnormally large head and mouth that showed incredibly sharp teeth with six eyes, two of which were much larger than the others. The individuals looked identical like twins, and they both roared in their direction with their multitude of eyes, looking at different heroes from her party, shuddering somewhat as one eye looked directly at her. You play support, we'll take them on. Stinger quietly told her as he prepared himself for combat. The other heroes charged at the two cat creatures, one of the cats lashed out with its large claws at Peach Terry which he deflected with his sword. He slashed at the creature's wrist only dealing superficial damage before jumping back at a tail swipe. Meanwhile Heavy Kong attempted to use his metal bracers to strike the cat who was focused on Terry, but his attack was deflected by its twin, which avoided a spear thrust from Stinger at the same time using its tail to wrap around Kong's arm and throwing him towards Genji causing him to stop and catch the man using his skates to slow the impact but still resulting in him moving backwards a couple of feet. The second cat used its tail to swipe its finger but he reacted quickly using his spear to jump out of the way, landing on lighting Genji who was speeding back at the monsters. The cat monster successfully dodged Stinger but was hit by Genji in the legs with his batons it howled as its muscle spasms. Seeing his chance Peach Terry tried to strike again, but the second monster covered for its brother using its mass to shoulder check Peach Terry into a nearby building crashing through the window. Momo quickly tried to see if the heroes was okay but her movement must have triggered the monsters to her presence as one launched out past the hero group and charged at her. She summoned three full body shields as the cat slashed at her. The shields were cut straight through, but the blow missed its mark. She created a flashbang grenade and thrown it in the creature's face while using a piece of the shield to block her face from the effects and kept moving in the direction of Terry. As she got to the window Terry was already coming back out into the fight. Seeing the hero was okay she turned her attention back to the cat she blinded, rubbing its face and trying to clear its vision. Stinger attempted to stab it through the chest, but he saw something out of the corner of his eye, quickly redirecting his spear into a blocking position which stopped the second cat's tail that was headed his way sending him back somewhat. The second cat covered its brother while it regained its vision. They're covering each other's backs, Genji said. Tell me something I don't know, we got to split them up. Peach, Kong, think you can handle one on its own, Stinger said. I believe we can. Peach Terry said confidently brushing off some glass from his clothes. Problem is getting them separated, Stinger said. I have an idea, Momo said calmly. Shoot, Stinger said immediately. Well these creatures resemble cats in some ways, right? So perhaps they are also deterred by the same smells. Just give me time and I should be able to create a big batch of lavender oil that should separate them. If we can manage to pour it on one. All right you do that, well hold them off just tell us when you're ready. Stinger commented. The act of the flashbang were finally start to wear off and the cat creature began to stare daggers at the girl. They both launched off their feet to attack the group, the previously blinded one going straight for Momo, but was intercepted by Heavy Kong using his braces to block the creature's bite. 
Terry used his sword to slash at the creature's chest, causing some blood to spill from the fur releasing its bite as it recoiled in pain. The pain screech from its sibling momentarily drew the other monster's attention enough for Stinger to land a direct thrust to the creature's face, but the creature dodged just in time and smacked him with its tail as he flew behind it. Genji charged forth at the beast using his batons the beast leapt away before it could strike him. It then slammed its paws into the street causing numerous cracks and fissures to spring up in front of it. Using the spare ruble, it started launching rocks at Genji forcing him back and cursing himself that the monster found his weakness. Being on rocket-boosted skates he couldn't excel on uneven terrain without the potential of falling, which in this instance can prove deadly. He retreated and had to go around, onto the sidewalks to get back into the fight, giving Stinger a ride as well. Heavy Kong struck hard and hit the beast in the gut with his fist. If it felt pain it didn't show it and returned the jester sending the man rocketing back. Terry approached at the same time and slashed its outstretched arm with his blade, but the attack was withdrawn as he pulled the sword back as the creature slashed out with his claws in with its other arm forcing him to parry the strike. Heavy Kong struggled to get back on his feet. He was stopped by the creationist beside her was a large cannon. I'm ready, just lead one of them over here and get out of the way. Momo said confidently, Heavy Kong was in shock for a moment from where the cannon came from but refocused and got back into the fight. He saw Peach Terry avoid another slash from the beast, just to end up next to Kong. The girl is ready, we gotta get one to the cannon behind us, Kong said. Cannon? Terry said confused. Yeah, I don't know either, but either way that's the plan, I'll try to get its tail and you cut it off okay? Then we retreat back. Terry nodded in understanding and quickly dodged to the side as the creature attempted to bisect him with his claws. Terry cut into its arm some more causing more blood to flow. The cat attempted to whip its tail out. Heavy Kong stepped in the way and barely caught the blow leaving its tail vulnerable and Peach Terry took the opportunity to use his strongest attack Peach Ripper. The attack nearly cut straight through the tail in one hit but left it intact somewhat dangling causing the beast to unleash a guttural howl of pain. While not completely bisecting the tail like intended, Peach Terry assumed that it would be enough for the plan to commence. Heavy Kong was already retreating back, and he followed along with him, and just like they intended the cat ran after them full of rage in its eyes. They both got a signal from the creationist, and they dodged out of the way. Taken by surprise the cat was hit directly in the chest with the oil. The heavy smell of lavender in the air permeated everywhere suddenly the cat creature began to rub itself and drag on the floor trying to get it off. The other cat shook its head from the scent granting another opening for Genji to hit the cat full force shocking it slightly. The cat that was splashed with the oil began to run towards its siblings but as it got close the sibling let out a large hiss of anger and the doused cat instead began to run away in a different direction. Success, Peach Terry said. Thank you creationist, we will handle that one, you help them with this one. Kong said as he and Terry ran off to chase after the fleeing monster. The two heroes followed after the monster as it ran the smell of lavender, making it easier to track down along with the blood trail it was leaving from its injured tail. The two followed the trail into an alley, and the scent was extremely heavy. They entered the alleyway just to see nothing there. Before either hero could react the cat dropped down from the ceiling and smashing a double-handed fist straight into Heavy Kong's skull which plummeted the man straight into the ground knocking him out. Peach Terry reacted quickly slicing at the monster with his sword hitting the arm and causing slight bleeding. The monster quickly turned its head and caught Terry's sword with his teeth. He tried to pull it out with no luck and before he could fully dodge again the cat's claw came down slicing down his chest luckily the amount of space he created allowed him to only be hit by one of his claws but it was still enough to send him to his knees. He stared at the cat about to attack again when it began to flare up, and it left without a moment's notice. Terry fell to the floor as he heard footsteps approaching from around the corner. Bakugo was beginning to get restless with all this waiting. He already bored himself with the training room and briefly visited Kirishima and Sato in the gym to pass the time. Todoroki on the other hand spent most of his time in the training room by himself. He offered to spar against Bakugo, but the teen merely scoffed and walked away to do his own thing. Eventually the intercoms rang inside the HQ for both Todoroki and Bakugo to meet in the common area Hash 5, which they assumed were their normal meeting place, and it turned out to be correct. 
they were met with the same man from before. Finally, I was getting bored. Bakugo fumed. What are the details of the mission we are about to embark on? Todoroki inquired. Oh, it's just a simple monster extermination operation, the agent said, waving his hand dismissively, gesturing for the boys to follow him. As the teens followed behind the agent, Todoroki casted a slight glance to Bakugo who returned it with his own. Something about this didn't feel right. The car ride was uneventful. They eventually arrived at their destination. The teens were initially confused as they had arrived near a park area and a kids' league baseball match was currently going on in the center. I need both of you to remain here. I will return with Geno's. The agent said before taking off in the direction of a bench where Demon Cyborg sat. As he approached the bench Geno's addressed him. You're abusing your power by calling me here. I figure that this is a more personal request for you to be meeting me outside of headquarters, Geno's asks stoically. That's quite an attitude for a new guy. He jested as he sat on the bench next to the Genos. But you are correct. A creature I have been secretly raising escaped confinement. I want you to destroy it. He said worriedly. This creature was defeated by another hero, wasn't it? I will worry about regretting it later. You will also be appropriately compensated. You must begin searching right away. Will there be a monster evacuation warning? Genos asked seriously. I have already cleared the area under the pretense of investigating pollutants. This requires the utmost of secrecy, he said wiping the sweat from his face. Genos turned his face to look at the other two teens. How much do they know? Genos asked. They only know that there is a monster extermination, not that the monster was a pet so please keep that information to yourself, the associate member said. Fair enough, I'll accept your request. Where is the area? Just follow me, I will take you there. The agent said standing up and proceeding to the car with Genos following behind. The duo didn't say anything to the cyborg as they continued back into the car. The drive was somewhat tenser, the, the ride over to the park, but nothing extreme. The car stopped in front of the checkpoint barrier, Todoroki and Bakugo got out and saw a familiar figure walking up to them. Bakugo, Todoroki you guys are going in there too, Shoji asked. Two? Someone else went in there? Todoroki asked. Yeah, Momo got here a small time before you all showed up, Shoji replied. What? Todoroki said a bit in shock. Why would Ponytail be in there? Bakugo asked quizzically. I don't know. She was accompanying four others and a battle was probably imminent. Shoji remarked. Genos had begun to walk forward into the area using his sensors to track down the monster. They marched around attempting to listen for anything or see anything that would signify a battle taking place. Todoroki was worried for Yairazu. They didn't know much of anything revolving what they were going up against and being unprepared can lead to injury or worse. He was about to ask for answers from Genos before something caught their attention. A heavy scent that permeated the air smelled like lavender. Genos sped up his march into a jog and turned the corner of the street just to bend down and touch something on the street. Was that blood? It led into the alley. The three of them jogged towards the direction to see two men down on the floor. One of them writhing in pain began to sit up using his sword to balance himself in a kneeling position. Who are you? Genos asked with a serious expression. I am a class hero Peach Terry, that is a class hero Heavy Kong, he said pointing to the unconscious person behind them. You are the new S-class hero Demon Cyborg, correct? Like you, we received a request to destroy a monstrous creature. Did you find it? Genos asked. Yes, but there were two of them. We assumed it would be better if we split them up and wiped them out separately, but we underestimated its strength and we ended up like this. It fled without devouring you? Genos asked surprised by the act of mercy. No, I believed it sensed your approach. Eep. The hero let out a cry of surprise as it looked up above Genos. A large monstrous meow left the creature's lips and Genos activated his jets, but before rocketing off towards the creature he told the two students. You two take care of them, I'll handle this. And before they could comment or reply he immediately set off into the monster, knocking it back and away from the alleyway. Todoroki didn't really care about what the demon cyborg said at the moment. You said that there were two of them, what happened to the second one? Also you said we, did your party have a girl with you? Her name is Yayurazu and her hero name is Kreati. 
Todoroki said with urgency. You're referring to the creationist I believe, yes she was with us. She's battling the other one a couple streets down, she's with Lighting Genji and Stinger. Todoroki was relieved that she wasn't fighting one of those creatures alone, but he still wanted to go check up on her. Hey, do you idiots need help getting out of here, or are you okay? Bakugo questioned. Ugh no I can still move, the wound isn't too crippling to move, you want to go help your friend I understand. I'll take Heavy Kong back to one of the checkpoints on the outskirts. Bakugo nodded in return and turned to see Todoroki almost immediately speeding away. He quickly followed after him using his explosions, leaving Peach Terry bewildered in their wake. The cat monster leaped at Yayurazu just as she predicted. She was quickly saved by lighting Genji, picking her up setting her down out of harm's way. The cat attempted to leap again at them, but found its feet stuck in some sort of sticky substance. It attempted to free itself from sticky substance, but luck favored them again as the lighting Genji charged ahead. Stun Baton Two-Handed Style Maximum Electricity Here I go. Forgetting its feet for the moment, the monster launched a strike at the hero. Jeji quickly avoided the blow, using its arm as a ramp to get towards the creature's large head and delivering a double baton strike. The creatures howled in pain and recoiled from the blow, but recovered quicker than Genji expected punching Genji out of the sky. He signaled Stinger to attack before landing softly into a crash pad and rolling onto his feet. Stinger came from above the creature spearing down and cutting off the creature's right foreleg before jumping away towards Yayurazu and Genji as a large metal net was shot out at the monster, restricting it more. Are you good Genji? Stinger asked. I'm fine, I have enough charge for one attack. All right, the next is the kill, creating you with me? Wait wait kill, I thought we were going to capture the creature, do we really have to kill it? Momo said recovering from the shock of seeing the creature's limb being cut off. Well obviously that's what we came here T, Stinger turned around only to see a massive behemoth standing behind the group. Momo and Genji turned to see what had caught the hero's attention to see a behemoth that was twice the size of the creature they were currently facing. Stinger thought fast and quickly grabbed Momo like a duffel bag and hopped on Genji and the three of them sped away as the creature yelled out a loud guttural screech that permeated throughout the city. Run, run, we can't fight something like that, Stinger said fearful. What a monster, Lighting Genji said as he continued to try and escape. Creaty, can you create some more flashbangs? Stinger said worriedly as the creature began to catch up to them. She quickly created two flashbang grenades and handed it to Stinger who threw them directly at the creature bouncing off its face and exploding in a blast of light. The creature was momentarily stunned, rubbing its eyes. Stinger found that they made progress, but not as fast as he liked. Creaty, can you create something fast to transport yourself? Stinger said seriously. I ugh. Can but it will take some time, she said. Well get to it, we'll try and give them the runaround and give you more chance to escape. The extra weight is slowing us down, we need to get you out of here first. Stinger said confidently leaving no arguments for her to protest. She complied and started making a vehicle having to have Stinger lift her up by her armpits so that the creation could fully come out. She created a moped, shocking Stinger somewhat. Really not even a motorcycle or something he said in disbelief, but quickly shaking his head and refocusing. All right, well give you time, give me some flashbangs and some grenades of that sticky substance. Stinger said as he put her down on the scooter, she obliged and began to drive away. I'll try and bring back up, don't worry, Momo said as she drove off. Lighting Genji changed direction charging forth back towards the monster whose eyes just began to clear, it quickly attended to its child caught in the net and saw as the two heroes drew closer. As the third ran off into the distance, the two heroes threw two more object at them, but thinking quickly the mom monster quickly hacked up a massive hairball that intercepted and encased the object muffling the effects of the flash. The hero charged forward, but as they did Stinger caught something out of the corner of his eye. It was a little girl running towards something. Quickly informing Lighting Genji, they redirected into an alleyway after the girl. The kid monster began to pursue, but was halted by its mother. It pointed forward further away down the street towards the girl further away, and it obeyed and ran after her, while the mother followed behind the other two heroes. Yayurazu was fatigued, retracing their steps to get towards the gate so she could signal for help. 
No doubt they probably heard the roar from that larger monster, so they may have already left to investigate so hopefully she would run into them earlier than she expected to. But before she could think more about it, a sudden rock hit the back of her bike, sending her spiraling towards ground. She quickly created a pad for her to slide on as her moped went flying off in the distance. She looked back as the smaller creature charged at her with one arm. The bleeding appeared to stop, which suggested some sort of regeneration, but she had no other time to think as it threw another rock at her directly forcing her to dodge out of the way. She created her concrete gun and began shooting, but the shots barely affected the creature as it charged forward, even as she shot at its feet. She began to back up as she created a large wall of steel to separate herself from the creature, but it didn't matter the creature completely punctured through the wall nicking her side, causing her to stagger back from the cut clutching the wound and while making a band-aid to put over it to stop the bleeding. The monster threw the steel mass away and continued forwards. Momo didn't know what she could do everything she created this creature would just break through like some toy. She remembered Drive Knight had said how her materials were brittle, but that's it. She quickly fished into her pocket and pulled out the staff that Drive Knight gave her pushing the button and activating it. As the creature lunged at her with its arm hoping to skewer her as she blocked with a staff she was pushed back a few feet, but she was surprised that it wasn't further perhaps the staff have some sort of shock absorption. She really couldn't think about that now as the beast jumped at her again. She couldn't avoid the beast this time only holding the staff between her and its massive paw, which left her pinned under it. The creature slowly lowered its head down hoping to bite her, but she suddenly heard a familiar voice from her side. Yairazu, it sounded like Todoroki and almost to confirm her her theory. She suddenly felt the chill of cold and the monster in front of her was almost completely frozen from the legs up the only part not frozen was part of its paw that was pressed against her. She slid out from under the monster and looked at her classmate who stared in shock as he noticed the bleeding bandage on her side. Are you okay? Todoroki asked immediately, noting her wound. I'm fine it wasn't a deep cut, but how come you are here? As she said that Bakugo arrived next to him, angered that the fight was over already. Demon Cyborg received the same mission those chumps did from the association. Bakugo said indignantly. Speaking of them, where are they? Did they abandon you? She saw certain anger fill Todoroki features but quickly shook her head. No, no nothing like that. They tried to give me time to escape, but I guess the smaller one came after me instead. Smaller one? Bakugo inquired curious. Yes, there was a much larger one double the size of this one. They're probably fighting it right now. We must help them. She said getting to her feet but slightly staggering from the loss of lipids for the day. Hold on. Me and Bakugo will handle this. You just get back to Shoji near TH. Todoroki was interrupted by a loud shout from the heavens drill stinger. Suddenly the cat monster caged in ice was pierced completely though the skull and its body falling towards the floor unceremoniously. It was Stinger who came up to the three of them. Whoever managed to freeze that thing thanks for that. He said smiling widely as he tossed his spear on his shoulder. That thing was completely helpless, there was no need to kill it. Todoroki said somewhat coldly. It's what we're sent here to do, come on now it's just a monster anyways it what we do. He said dismissively, earning a glare from all three teens present, but Momo snapped out of it first. What happened to the larger one, she inquired. That? I don't know when we went back to fight them, but we found a little girl still here, so we rescued her, but I wanted to check to see if you were okay, so I let them go on without me. She said that she came here with some B-class, but also ran into the new S-class hero demon cyborg. He'll probably take care of it. Stinger said, and as he spoke there was a resounding boom that resounded around the area. The group of four chased down the sound to come up to a scene of the monster having been completely obliterated and burning on fire. Dang the demon cyborg works fast, Stinger said with a whistle. The group began to walk back down towards the exit and spotted a teen holding a cat away from a bald man and demon cyborg upon noticing their presence Genos addressed them. I see that you two managed to find your friend and Stinger you were assigned this mission as well, Genos remarked. Yup and don't worry I think we got all of them. Thanks for taking care of the mother by the way we definitely couldn't fight that thing on our own, Stinger said, holding his hand out for the cyborg to shake. Genos only looked at the hand then pointed towards Saitama. 
It was my master that defeated the mother, not me. Gino said pointing towards the bald B-class, only getting a laugh from Stinger in return. To the sudden glare of Gino's. That's a good one and here I thought you were the ultra-serious type. He began walking towards where his friends were near the checkpoint passing Gino's and patting his shoulder ignoring the glare and unknowing of the hand that stopped Gino's from punching him in the face. Before turning and looking over his shoulder at Creationist. Yeah, you coming? I didn't really get to show you my skills very much here, given the circumstances. Momo hesitated, casting a glance between him and her friends, before thanking Todoroki for saving her life and continuing forward after Stinger. Gino's began to stare at the two teens which agitated Bakugo enough to point it out. You got a problem, Trashbot, he sneered. No, I was just thinking about your classmates. Doesn't one of them have the ability to control animals? Why would the association ask master of this child's quest when they could have just used him? Gino said curiously in thought hearing that Saitama turned at his student surprised and yelled. What? Out for a stroll, metal bat, Koda. A chew. Koda silently sneezed his way. The hell? How you gonna catch a cold in this weather? Metal bat said as he was walking. In front of Koda he said as they were walking around the city. No, no it must have just got caught in my nose. He said quietly slowly pacing behind his hero. You have to learn to speak up more, say things with your chest. If you keep the way you are, people will just walk all over you. Metal Bat said as he looked over the shoulder at the timid teen. He only received a nod in return which only earned a suck of the teeth from the hero. As the duo continued to walk through the streets, nothing seemed to have been happening today. As the duo went around the city looking for any signs of danger, nothing seemed out of the ordinary or wrong until Koda saw a woman being harassed by some men in the alleyway. He looked to call Metal Bat over. Metal Bat, there are some guys harassing some girls over there, Koda said. So, I don't care about petty criminals, but by all means stop them if you want to. Metal Bat said casually walking away, leaving exasperated Koda in his wake. The teen took one last look at the supposed hero that walked away from someone in distress, before dashing towards the alleyway with the men and the girl. He stopped at the entrance of the alley and yelled to get the villain's attention. Hey, leave her alone. Koda said with a serious expression. The five men turned to look at the kid and began to laugh at how ridiculous he looked. The five men looked like the standard for street thugs, piercings, leather jackets, tattoos, the works, no matter the universe they all remained the same. Listen kid, given the outfit I guess that you're a hero, huh? Probably a C-class given that I never saw your face anywhere, a relatively new one at that. Just for the record Mr. P hero, I have a B-class bounty on my head slasher, so I suggest you better run off before it starts looking ugly for you. The villain held out a pocket knife in front of him threateningly. Koda didn't move or budge from the threat, instead screaming instead down the alleyway with his Anna voice. Ha ha, what did you scare him that ba? The villain behind Slasher was cut off as herd movement scampering behind him. A swarm of rats began charge forth throughout the alley at the five men, who all turned to look at the amassed creatures, they served out of the way of the girl and went straight for them. The four villains tried to retaliate shooting their weapons at the swarm, but barely denting its number the four were consumed kicking and screaming in as the rats clawed at their body. The slasher was performing much better alternatively he was blur as the blade slashed at the oncoming rats bisecting multiple at a time, but jumping back from being overwhelmed he changed tactic and charged at the coda instead who hesitated and took a step back nearly avoiding a slash to his neck as he tripped over his own feet in fear. The slasher was above him looking down, preparing to stab him while he was on the floor. He tried to brace himself for the attack, but none came as the blade fell unceremoniously to the ground beside him. He looked to the side and saw Metal Bat standing next to him. I told you that you need to work on your body, animals won't always be there to save you. Metal Bat said as he stood up holding the unconscious slasher before putting him on the ground looking in the alleyway. Hey, call them off he said motioning to the rats in the alley that were still attacking the men and some even started attacking the girl. Koda tried but the rats seemingly stopped for a moment before another roar set them back into a frenzy and began their assault on the two of them instead. What? was Koda only reply as a larger creature dug up from the ground. It was a large mouse that was twice his height with spider legs protruding from its body. 
Who is that making that incessant noise? Who dares control my children? It said anger in his voice. It narrowed its eyes at the two heroes then at him causing him to shiver from its gaze. You? You think you can control my kind? That only belongs to me, the mouse master. The creature charged directly at him but was intercepted by Metal Bat. Wait, I'm sorry if I put your kids in harm's way. We can just leave and go our separate ways. Coda responded in his Anna voice, getting in between the two. You humans believe you are so superior, killing when you believe it just and begging for mercy when you can't escape the consequences. But not me, there will be blood spilled for every one of my brood killed a human shall die in its place. It charged at Coda again with its front spider legs coming down to pierce his body, but was intercepted by Metal Bat again. I don't know what you two were talking about, but it seemed to just make him angrier, leave this to me. Metal Bat ready himself and charged at the beast, swinging his bat which missed the monster barely using its legs to jump away. He ordered his mob of rats to charge the hero and stood in awe as Metal Bat slammed his bat into the mob sending most of them scattering and those in the epicenter being squished into the ground. Enraged by this mouse master leaped down from his rooftop charging at the hero. Unleashing webs from its mouth that the hero dodged, Metal Bat swiftly dodged the webbing and drew back his bat, swinging with full force and knocking the rat monster head off sending it flying through the alleyway. With the loss of their master, the rats all began to run away from the area, escaping back into vents and sewer away from the gathering crowd. Metal Bat hefted his bat on his shoulder looking disappointed. That was barely a workout. Metal Bat said dismissively before looking at Coda. You okay? He asked the still stunned teen on the ground. Ah uh, yes I guess, he mumbled, before meeting the hero's eyes. You came back to help me, he asked. Of course I did, I ain't gonna abandon ya, I just wanted to see what you're made of," he said encouragingly. Before he could reply he was suddenly hugged by a woman, but she was taller than he was her ample bosom was directly in his face causing the teenager to blush fully and almost completely shut down even as she stopped hugging him. He could barely make out what she said from his heavy blushing and he doesn't even remember answering the woman if she had any questions for him. But he was slapped out of his trance by Metal Bat who wrapped his arm around his neck. Well things ain't too bad you caught us this bounty with that stunt along with the monster you managed to summon here. Bounty? Coda questioned. Yeah, that guy said he was a B-class bounty. So there is a reward for bringing him S one of the best ways to make money besides fighting monsters directly. He said pointing to the unconscious guy on the ground. I I see. Well that was one bright side to all this, but there was these nagging thoughts that he inadvertently killed Mouse Master by summoning his brood here, and now those rats will be without a leader and… If you're worried about that monster don't be, whatever it said it was full of shit. If we didn't stop it today, it would have just rampaged another day and caused some actual damage. Metal Bat said, looking at him directly, only seeing a nod in reply from the teen. Combat Training Zombieman, Takoyami, Toru. You both look different. The association I assume, Zombieman said as he looked at his two protégés. Receiving a nod from Tokoyami he answered. Apparently our appearances have caused quite a stir among the populace so they issued us this stuff to ease their concerns. He said indifferently. Yeah, we don't know what fully happened but Momo messaged us that something happened with Shoji yesterday, they thought he was monster. Toru said next to them. By they I assume you mean the police, Zombieman inquired. I don't really know, we tried to press for details but both of them couldn't text much as they're both on a mission right now. Toru replied. Why would you assume the police are the ones that cause trouble? Takoyami asked suspiciously. There is a bunch of bad blood between the police and the association. There is a bunch of bad blood between the two powers. As such they share almost no information with each other let alone secrets like you all. If memory serves me correctly the only other mutant type we're informed of was with Tank Top Master, meaning he was with the Tank Tops at the time of the incident, no hero will mess with the Tank Toppers. It's the only possible explanation. A very thorough examination. Tokoyami said with some cynicism only receiving a shrug in response from the hero. Wait, why would the Hero Association and police be fighting against each other? Zombieman only let out a sigh before begging to tell the two of the rivalry between the two factions and how badly the police were losing. 
After some questioning from the teens their conversation grew silent. Where are we going anyways? Takoyami asked as they walked through the forest where seemingly no one was present coming towards a clearing with a single tree stump in the center. I wanted to take you guys away from everyone so that you can have some peace of mind, but the association beat me to that. So what did you want us away for? Toru asked. Combat training, said simply gesturing for them to stop as he continued forward, taking off his jacket near the tree stomp and sat down with his desert eagle in his hands, making the kids nervous. Relax. He shot at the ground near the teens revealing that the round he just fired were made of paint. I ain't gonna go hard on you too, I just wanna see what you all are made of. Ready? He said, relaxing again. The two teens looked at each other, actually looked at each other Takoyami noted still getting used to visually seeing Toru. She had a somewhat worried expression that he shared, but maybe it was just him, but maybe saw a bit of excitement in her features. It was hard to tell. I'm game for this. She said nodding in Takoyami direction. As am I, Takoyami nodded in return. Both teens turned their heads back towards Zombiman and nodded. He gave them the go-ahead to start whenever they were ready and started their attack on the hero Dark Shadow began the assault charging at the hero. Zombiman waited for the shadow to approach him and knocked it aside when it got to close dodging out of the way of one claws as it passed. Takoyami worried for his friend that struggled to get up. It shook itself off and began to attack again it enlarged its hand attempting to crush the hero who still sat there on the tree stomp. The hand came down fast and the hero didn't move a muscle instead only extending his hands outwards and stopping the blow cold earning a shocked gasp from Takoyami. Zombiman used his other hand with weapon and shot it directly at Takoyami he was too slow to dodge the bullet it stroke him directly in the chest forcing him and Dark Shadow to fall backwards. Toru noticed Dark Shadow began to retract towards Takoyami, she charged next. Noticing the hero raising his weapon again, she started using her warp refraction to blind the hero as she closed the distance. She successfully landed multiple punches on the hero's face and body, but it felt like she was attacking solid steel instead, she was sure that she was taking more damage from the exchange than she was as he didn't even try to attack her back. She at least could attempt to blind him so Takoyami could maybe do something, but as she went to poke his eyes out, she felt a searing pain on her leg causing her to fall to the floor holding her leg in pain. Takoyami recovered and could finally see again as Toru went down next to the hero who looked down at her from his seated position questioningly. Takoyami charged Dark Shadow forth, but not at the hero, but at his friend to his surprise however the hero threw her right at him. He caught her but suddenly fell back as Takoyami took three more shots to his chest. But he fought through the pain and reeled Dark Shadow and Toru back towards him. He was shocked that the hero didn't even have to move to defeat them. But there was also the issue of Toru and his quirks being direct opposition to each other. The hero suddenly disappeared and he found a strong punch to his stomach that floored him. Toru was dropped by Dark Shadow and immediately went to his master aid only to receive multiple shots to its face forcing him to the ground. Toru recovered enough to stand and went to help her down friend charging at the hero standing above him who raised his weapon but then lowered it, thus letting the girl attempt to hit him but blocking each attempt with one hand before shooting her in the stomach once which had her writhing on the floor. He walked back to the tree stomp and sat back down putting his jacket back on, lighting a cigarette before calling the exercise. Well, I didn't really have much expectations, but it did let me get a read on you. The students were still recollecting themselves from the damage before walking towards the hero as he spoke. I was kinda disappointed in you guys' lack of teamwork. You two didn't fight together very often. And no, our quirks are too incompatible to fight together. Dark shadow weakness is light and excessive light like she can emit hurts him. Takoyami said huffing. Yeah, I'm not much of a fighter myself. Toru said, holding her stomach slightly chuckling to herself. I noticed, but why? You're completely invisible. You should take advantage of that. At least you should practice in martial arts to better know how to take down an opponent. Zombiman stated matter-of-factly. I never really thought of that before. Me being invisible kinda limited my options in participating in activities. Toru replied meekly. And that light thing, what was that about? Zombiman asked. My quirk, along with invisibility, gave me the ability to manipulate light. I reflected off myself to blind those around me. 
Interesting. Well, for you, Takoyami, I see that you let your quirk fight for you, but that doesn't mean to neglect training your own body. He let out a puff of smoke above him. Now that I know your weaknesses, we can learn to work past them starting with you. He pointed towards Toru. Being invisible won't be enough to win against everyone. I'll try to find a martial arts teacher that can help you, and you should work on your light manipulation more. For now though both of you need some physical training. He said as he looked at the two teens, gesturing for them to follow him for a run through the forest. Abandonment, bang, Chiranko, Ajiro, Midoriya. Just as the day before, the training began with a several kilometer run around Bang's dojo, and just like before Midoriya and Bang took off to go patrol the streets. This time, however, Ojiro didn't have to antagonize Chiranko to continue with his run, the kid just silently continuing forward behind him as he ran behind him. Deciding to keep up his fellow student's motivation, he looked over his shoulder and flashed the Chiranko a sly smile before using his tail to throw a few rocks at the blonde teen behind him. Chiranko reacted quickly dodging a few and even catching some others. This successfully angered the teen again, and he began to attempt to throw the rocks back in Ojiro's direction, but they mostly all fell flat so he decided to increase his pace to get closer, but that had the adverse effect of tiring him out quicker meaning the rocks he threw held little power behind them. Ojiro laughed at his fellow disciple's attempt, simply flicking the thrown rocks away with his tail or attempting to return them back to the sender. However, as his attention was on what was behind him, he didn't pay attention to where he was going and ended up slipping and falling down over some rocks. His fellow apprentice didn't help him up, but only laughed at him as he continued by as well as throwing a couple rocks at him as he passed. Ojiro wasn't mad at him, though, but he did want to get him back, so he quickly got up and dusted himself off and ran to catch up to him, cheating somewhat and using his tail to catapult him forward. The run came to an end with Ojiro in the lead as he bounded over Chiranko, smirking at him as he passed and reached the stairs of the dojo. Tha that was cheating, and you know it, Chiranko managed out between breaths. All fair in love and war Ojiro breathed out, panting slightly. Having an augment isn't fair, I wish I had a tail like that. Did you make it yourself? Chiranko asked as he sat on the stairs. Well I didn't make it myself, it was just kinda given to me. Audrio said through a half chuckle as he used his tail to wipe the sweat off his face. Can I try it? It looks super cool. I like how it looks more mechanical now than before where it looked more fleshy. Chiranko reasoned. Ugh, I, it was custom made for me, no one else can use it. Ojiro hesitated somewhat trying to come up with the lie. Well I guess, that makes sense, wouldn't want someone taking it from you and using it against you. But what's with the hair on the end? Chiranko said, rubbing his head somewhat. I really don't know, maybe it helps with regulating temperature, was his completely honest answer. I do know that people love to touch it. My friends have a habit of absentmindedly rubbing their hands through it. Maybe it's something that can help civilians remain calm in dangerous situations. Ajiro reasoned with some more thought to it. Interesting. Chiranko said as he looked at his fellow disciple's tale. Go ahead. Ajiro said absently, shocking the teen as he knew what he was thinking, stretching out and touching the hair on the end of his tail and sailing how soft the fabric seemed and how real it felt. He took his hands away a moment later and the two sat on the steps catching their breath before going up towards the dojo. After getting inside and hydrating both students began to practice forms and counters of the water stream rock smashing fist. You said that your tail can be used to comfort people, so I assume you want to be a hero? Chiranko commented, blocking the right jab from Ojiro. Yeah well I am already a hero technically, I'm C-class rank 90. Ajiro said blocking an overhead kick. Whoa, that's cool. Chiranko said grinning, jumping over a sweep kick. Well, what about you? Why are you practicing martial arts? Ajiro asked, redirecting a roundhouse kick. But at that question Chiranko froze. As he thought to himself of why he was still there, he couldn't say the real reason was just to look good for girls so instead he said. I just wanted to get stronger, besides I don't want to just leave Bang by himself since everything that happened. As he said that Bang and Midoriya came back in from their patrol, and they all went to their seats as Bang began to speak on what they will do next for the day. For today I would like to go over one of the techniques of my martial arts, a state of being called abandonment. 
it is the art of visualizing and anticipating your opponent's moves and weaknesses. Combined with a rock-smashing fist, you should be able to catch and pierce your opponent's attacks and defenses respectively. He lectured. We will split off into two teams of two. I will give your opponent a pattern of moves that you are allowed to use. We will rotate partners after some time. The group split up into Midoriya with Bang and Ojiro with Chiranko. Bang and Midoriya stood a couple of feet from the other. Bang had given him the paper of the moves he could perform which were a right jab, a right roundhouse kick, a left elbow, a left snap kick, and spin hook kick. Midoriya had put the paper to the side and instructed as waited for his teacher to signal the exercise to begin. He did and Midoriya instantly raised his full cowling to 100% and waited for his teacher to make a move. He used his eyes to wander all over the designated limbs as he waited for one to move. Maybe he should be paying attention to his center of body instead. It allow him greater chance of seeing all his movements besides staring at one specific body par. Suddenly Midoriya took a light jab to his face and stared at his teacher. You think too much. It slows your judgment which inversely slows your movement. He said calmly as he got into a stance again. Midoriya nodded and took a stance again, staring at his teacher wondering how he would strike next. A sudden flash appeared and Midoriya held his guard high just to feel a light tap to his gut. Bang performed a low roundhouse kick to the stomach instead of another jab that Midoriya was aspecting. I don't think I would do the same move twice do you? He said with a jovial smile. The test went on like this for some time Midoriya, not being able to properly predict where Bang was going to strike next. He even attempted to use his danger sense to better anticipate the attack, but he received no luck on that front either Bang held no killing intent for him to notice. The rest of the training went the same way for Ojiro and Chiranko Nifir were able to properly predict each other's attacks very well, but Ojiro managed to block some instances, and when the time came to switch partners the same outcome played out, although Midoriya did better in reacting to Ojiro's blows, but that could have been due to a number of other factors of how he knew him better and how much faster he was than his classmate even when having powered down to 15% full cowling to make the match somewhat more fair. The exercises continued like this for the remainder of their session. Lights Camera Action King Sweet Mask Mainta Aoyama Mainta and King were still practicing for the upcoming game tournament next week. He struggled on a way for him to bring up the interview that Aoyama mentioned. He was reminded of the importance of the interview when Momo sent a message to the class group chat speaking of the something happening to Shoji the other day. Not to mention how in the morning the more unique members of his class were given clothes to alter their appearance. He caught Aoyama eyes staring at him a few times in the morning, and after Momo had sent that message he was immediately privately messaged by Aoyama asking if he had asked King about the interview yet, to which he replied no, to Aoyama dismay. Mainta, why didn't you tell the class about the police report anyways? Aoyama if Shoji didn't talk about the events of the other day, then I have no right to do so either. Aoyama. Although the truth will probably be revealed later on today, which is even more reason for you to get confirmation on that interview, so we can deliver some good news as well. Mainta, don't worry I'm on it. The only reply he got was good luck in French surrounded by sparkle emoji. He returned from the bathroom and took a seat next to King who offered him a controller. Um King. I have a question for you, Mainta started hesitantly. Shoot. He said casually wondering why the teen was so nervous. How do you feel about live interviews, O King thought. Someone in the association probably wanted him to do an interview. Probably on the Asidi incident, it was pretty recent, and I doubt people would be satisfied with just the couple of statements he put out. But he didn't really feel like doing things live. It was too much pressure, and he wasn't really a fast thinker. Does it have to be live? King questioned. Ugh, I don't know. Let me check. Mainta sent a quick text to Aoyama, which after a moment he replied with a no. Sorry, it seems it has to be live. Sweet Mask demands it. Mainta said worriedly. Sweet Mask? King said hesitantly, his forehead beginning to sweat a bit. Sweet Mask was always shady in his eyes, and his demeanor was colder than he let on. He had a real hatred of phonies, and he was the biggest phony around. Ugh tell tell him I'll pass, he said gently wiping his head of sweat. But the sudden motion of Mainta standing up frightened him enough to jump back and look at him directly. He had a serious expression on his face. Please reconsider King, 
this is really important to me and to my friends as well. He was puzzled by his dedication to wanting him to take the interview. Why? What's the interview going to be about? Mainta shuffled with his phone a bit and then showed King his screen. This, it's a police report about one of my friends, they think he's a monster, but that's not true his powers like mine just took on a different shape, because of this incident my other friends who looks different also have to disguise themselves to continue to do hero work, and I don't want anything to happen to them by other heroes if something goes wrong. He said seriously nearly begging. King read the police report and looked at the teen in front of him. He weighed his options of what he should do. He doesn't really owe him or his friends anything, and even if this was the focal point of the live interview, most likely the sweet mask only wanted him there for his status and nothing else, but that didn't mean the interviewer couldn't wonder from topic and ask him all sorts of random questions that he wouldn't be able to answer or worst couldn't answer in fear of outing himself. He then remembered Saitama's words, if he truly wanted to be a hero then that means he would help people in need and this kid and his friends needed his help. If he could help them and alleviate public worries about the association, then he lived up to his name at least somewhat. He watched as the teen sat back down withdrawing his phone from his face, looking somewhat dejected. I'm sorry for getting all in your face, you barely know me or any of my friends you don't have any obli. I'll do it. King stopped Minta's speech, which made the teen do a double take. Really you will? He wanted to make sure he heard correctly. Yeah, sure. I can brave it for you guys, nobody should be forced to hide themselves from society, especially if they're in charge of protecting that society. Minta was nearly in tears from his speech, not only was King strong, but he was compassionate as well. He gave the man a quick hug and furiously typed on his phone sending Aoyama that King was in on the interview. Aoyama was ecstatic once he received the text message from Minta. He was still practicing on the mirrors in the gym. All he needed to do was wait for Sweet Mask to come back in from wherever he was at the moment. He managed to finally reflect his laser off five of the ten mirrors in the gym. Sweet Mask had replaced the one he destroyed much to his annoyance, however he couldn't deny the results he was begging to understand the trajectory of his laser more and more as he went on. The door suddenly came open with Sweet Mask with a towel behind his head in his usual dark outfit. He stopped his training for the moment to sweet mask annoyance, but he continued on towards the hero nonetheless. Sir, sir, King has agreed to the interview, Ayama said in a cheery mood. Hearing the news that the teen said sweet mask quickly bit back the remark he had on his lips. That is good news, I'm still finalizing the details myself, but I will let you know when a precise date is set. Now I want to know more about you and your friends, and not just the stuff the association told you to say either he said sternly before calming down somewhat. Telling people a lie is always more convincing when you mix in a little bit of the truth, so I need more information from you about you and your friend's abilities and powers. He rationalized. Well, um, as you may or may not know me and my friends are not of this earth, you could say that we're aliens, he said calmly. Interesting, if that is true, how did you come to learn our language? Sweet Mask queried. Well me and my friends think that we are from a parallel earth, Aoyama said. So the multiverse exists. Sweet Mask sat in thought on the potential of such a discovery could make. Well how did you all get here? Is your universe technologically savvy? That I do not know, we were just brought here by some being in the middle of a big fight. He said solemnly at the mention of what happened. And in this universe everyone has powers like you and your friends. Yes. Aoyama then went on to explain all the categories quirks can manifest as and how society in their universe worked. Fascinating, very fascinating. If I weren't so inclined I would have liked to create a story revolving around your adventures, but that is for another time. Aoyama flushed, thinking of his life as a story, then was incredibly saddened by his life as a story. Now back to training, I will cross-reference what you told me with the information provided by association and we will hopefully make a believable story to fool the public, if I find that you were lying to me. He said with a tightening fist to get his point across, making Aoyama furiously shake his head at the thought and quickly move away from the hero back towards his training nest. Good thing he told him basically everything he knew he thought as he shot lasers at the mirrors again. Let's get physical, Pig God, Darkshine, Kirishima, Sato. 
Sato and Kirishima just began walking down towards the gym area, talking about the mysterious Hero Association agent that greeted them earlier and speculated what he could have wanted from Shoji and the rest. Kirishima was confident in whatever it was that if Bakugo and Todoroki were involved they could handle it and he would actually feel sorry for any creature having to fight them. But Sato was unconvinced reminding Kirishima about that monster they fought in the simulations that defeated them in seconds. Kirishima grimaced at the remark but still thought that such a being was probably rare in this world otherwise there wouldn't be such relative peace going around. Kirishima also remarks that he wished he could have had some time with the machine just for training purposes. Gino said that it had recorded the Namu that they have fought previously which he could use as a scale he needs to climb to. The two continued talking as they walked towards the gym, opening the door to find Darkshine doing some light workout routine before stopping and addressing them as they got into the room. Hello, I hope you all had a good breakfast, he exclaimed as he approached them. Both of them nodded their head in agreement before Kirishima asked about the plans for the day. More of the same, more strength training. Have you figured out what type of body shape you're going for? Both Kirishima and Sato said they would go for a mesomorph build as it provided a good proportion of muscle mass throughout the body. Although Sato was curious about another physique that caught his attention in his search. Is pig god similar to a strong man in terms of his physique? Sato questioned Darkshine about his teacher. Darkshine hummed in thought about the question for some seconds before answering. I, I don't know really. I've never seen him around in the gym that I work out at, but that could be due to us maybe having different times we decide to work out in. I've never seen him fight either. From the stories I've heard of him say he is truly ravenous when it comes to fighting. Darkshine said, his hand gesturing in thought. That reminds me, when can we get a chance to patrol the streets and fight some villains? All this training is nice and all, but I'm not gonna know how much I progressed unless I go out and do something," Kirishima said, slamming two hardened fists together. Patrol? Oh, I don't really do such things. I'm mostly just the bodyguard of the association headquarters. Some more of the smart monsters try to attack here trying to get rid of the head of the association. Seeing the disappointment on Kirishima's face, he continued. Sometimes though the association sends me on some special missions from time to time, and I'm sure your friend here could take you out whenever Pig God decides to roam around town like he does. Darkshine said, gesturing to Sato next to him, who flashed Kirishima a thumbs up in response. So the association hands out people's special quests to complete. I guess that answers why that guy was there today asking for people. Sato said off handily. Yes, the association has many members that can hand out personal or association-related quests. This usually revolves around a bonus reward upon completion as well. Darkshine remarked. I hope to get one someday. Kirishima remarked with a cheeky grin. I'm sure you'll get your chance. For now, let's train up those bodies of yours. Your muscles will thank you for it later. Darkshine said as he made it over to some of the machines. As the boys did, their regular stretches for the day their training routine for the day. The beginning workout focused on more of the upper body, and the second half after the break would focus on the lower body, keeping a nice balance of symmetry. On their break time Kirishima caught Sato typing on his phone, sending a message to Ada. You're worried about him? Kirishima questioned with a raised brow. Yeah, he's by himself out there with a stranger no less who may not have the best attention for him. You heard what Demon Cyborg did with Bakugo and Todoroki. Sato mentioned. Yeah, but maybe not all of the S-Class are like that. Mr. Darkshine seems cool. Kirishima mentioned hearing his name Darkshine turn to the two teens after he exited the gravity chamber. Pardon? he asked. How is the hero Flash? I think his name was. Our friend went with him for a special mission for the month and Sato is worried about him. Kirishima mentioned. Darkshine rubbed his chin in thought before speaking. Flashy Flash, I think you mean. If so, you have nothing to worry about. He's one of the top-rated heroes in terms of combat, even among the S-Class heroes. Darkshine said with confidence. With that, I have no doubt, but what worries me is how he is around people, Sato mentioned, causing Darkshine to pause momentarily in thought. He's a pretty straightforward guy, although a bit mysterious. He's genuinely nice to people in his own cold way, as long as you don't impede him in some way, he's nonchalant, although he's a bit obsessed with looks. Darkshine chuckled somewhat. 
See, he's okay, I bet Ida is having a blast right now. Kirishima said with a smirk. Sato nodded in return feeling somewhat better about the situation. Ida had been texting the group chat suggesting he was okay, or at least able-bodied. Speaking of group chat, he saw a message from Yayarazu talking about something happening with Shoji the other day. Some of his classmates tried to press for further details, but he said that he would explain later. With that the two teens' break was over, and they both got back to work. Eventually by the time of the second break was over, Sato was using most of the time to get ready to leave saying farewell to both Darkshine and Kirishima as he exited the gym doors. Sato just got done saying goodbye to Kirishima and Darkshine walking towards the usual area that Pig God would hang around which unfortunately for him was usually around a kitchen of some sorts where Sato would be able to bake him sweets. Mentally preparing himself for the task he steps into the room to find Pig God already having a whole pallet full of sweets prepared. I guess this means no cooking for today, Sato said as a joke and somewhat seriously. Yup, today I wanna see what you can really do with that quick of yours, I even got the association to whip up something for ya. Pig God said still mostly focusing on his tray of sweets while throwing a small container at the teen, which he caught and inspected then began to open. You told me you needed 10 grams of sugar to get your quirk going so I got the guys to create an easier way you can digest them. Carrying packets of sugar on you in battle can be dangerous if the packets get ripped open and some spills out or if you aren't able to digest the whole thing in time. Pig God said, eating his sweets. Sato opened the small container inside were some chocolate balls. They closely resembled whoppers or milk duds from back in their world, but a little smaller. He looked back up at the hero with shock on his face, surprised by his consideration for him. Thanks. Yeah this will surely help in the process as well. How many of them do I have to take for my quirk to activate? Sat curiously hyped by this new advancement. Just one. The hero said casually. Just one. No way. He said ecstatically mind was blown by that statement. Now he could activate his quirk by simply popping one pill. He hoped it would taste good at least. Yup now follow me. Pig God said as he put down the now empty tray of sweets and picked up a bag of chips as he left the room Sato quickly following behind as he led them through the halls of the association. They came to another gym room, this one more suited for boxing if he had to guess going by the ring in the center, punching bags, punch machines, and other machines around. Pig God continued to the ring as Sato followed. All right, before we begin, I would like for you to ask you what would happen if you were to eat multiple 10 grams of sugar. Does anything special happen? What if you were to eat 10 grams, activate your ability, and that eats another 10 grams? Pig God questioned. Well, for each additional 10 grams I ingest post activation, I gain more time to use my quirk. For eating more at one time, I'm not really sure, but I don't believe it has any added benefits. Interesting. That's something we're going to have to test. Then for now pop one of the pills and let's see what you got. Pig God gestured to the container on his hip, which Sato gave a nod at, and began to take one of the small round candies from the container and ate it. Thankfully the taste wasn't bad, it tasted like a normal piece of chocolate. As he swallowed he felt the power begin to course through his body. Muscles began to enlarge and strengthen with power. He also felt that familiar numb feeling that was on the precipice of his mind, the feeling was very faint, but it was there, and as he came to learn would steadily grow until he was overwhelmed by it. He slowly put the container down and got into a stance, but hesitated for a moment as he saw the rather relaxed pose his opposition was in, still eating on his rather large bag of chips. Don't worry about me, you can start when you're ready. Pig God said. Sato nodded, and not having much time began with didn't argue with the hero and trusted in his abilities. Sato rushed forwards immediately wanting to test the hero first starting with a straight punch to his surprise the hero didn't bother blocking or evading from the attack, he just sat there eating away on his chips. He was even more shocked when the punch landed and it didn't even make the hero budge. His hand was seemingly absorbed by pig god's stomach before stopping somewhat around his wrist, the hero didn't even bat an eye. He performed another straight punch with his other hand to receive the same result. He back up slightly from the hero and decided to use his super combination attack sugar rush. The rush of blows still didn't phase the hero, but he decided to keep it up all the same, but he began to get slower and slower as that numb feeling increased inside of his mind. 
Before it could completely set in however, he went back towards the container he left in the corner of the gym and quickly digested another one. Oh? Is your time limit that short? Pig God questioned. Yeah, I managed to get it to around 5 minutes at first it was 3. What happens when the limit is up? I saw that you were starting to slow down. Yeah, the closer I get to my limit I start to experience symptoms of hypoglycemia or sugar crash if you will. I have lower brain cognitivity, decreased intelligence, and lethargy. He mentioned idly. I see, well in that case, I want you to see the limit all the way through this time all right. Remember I want to test if taking in multiple 10 grams of sugar initially would affect you in some way. Ah, sorry about that, Sato said, rubbing the back of his head. No problem, let's see what else you got. With that said Sato once again charged at Pig God, releasing a flurry of blows that didn't affect the hero at all. His attack style reminded him highly of Pry Pry Prisoner and his Angel Rush attack, but it was lacking something that he couldn't pinpoint maybe he could get them together whenever he inevitably breaks out of prison again. Pig God thought as he absentmindedly took Flurry from the teen, occasionally moving his chips bag out of the way of an oncoming punch that threatened to hit it and cause a mess and just like Sato said after nearly five minutes past Sato began to slow down until he finally halted where his body was stock still with his mouth agape swaying slightly side to side. Pig God picked the child up waiting for the teen to get his bearings which took around an hour worth of time and after a quick snack break they were at it again. This time in the ring Sato ate two pills at once, but he didn't feel any stronger than he did originally. Remind me to get the recipe to make these things myself. They would be fantastic upgrades for hero work. Sato mentioned idly as he launched a punch at Pig God, which unlike before the hero blocked. No problem, I'll have the association send me them and I'll get it right to you. It doesn't seem like you got any stronger than previously, but that's all right at least we tried. Keep going try to get a punch through. Pig God states as he waited for the teen to attack and Sato obliged him launching into a flurry of punches. Fetch, Watchdog Man, Asui. Asui was back in the center of Q City next to Watchdog Man's podium, feeling as the wind blew to and fro from her face as Watchdog Man leapt from the podium and returned with incredible speed. Her face grimaced slightly as she looked as his paws became more and more dirty with no doubt blood from the monsters he killed protecting people. She didn't hate him for it, but he was obviously strong enough to simply knock them unconscious so they can be picked up by the authorities so why doesn't he? She wondered. Deciding to just ask him she pulled out a snack from the bag that was given to her and asked her question. Why don't you capture the monsters you face, Ribbit? Ending her sentence with speak waving the treat for Dogman to see. Because they're monsters and it sends a strong message. Watchdog Man said simply. Asui sat puzzled by the response. Monsters were a blanket term that could list numerous individuals which if things were different could have included some of her friends. But some monsters were originally human. Doesn't he have any remorse for just killing them? As she thought of images of Jordan Down in that exhibit. But weren't some of those monsters originally human? Don't you think there is a chance we can save them, or at least turn them back into regular humans again? At very least get their memory back. Speak, Ribbit. From the history of mysterious beings, there have been no cases of monsters being re-indoctrinated. He said stoically, Asui mumbled under her breath. Not if you just kill all of them, they won't. To her surprise the hero heard her, but also he replied without the speak command. Why do you care so much, he asked slightly tilting his head while looking at her, but before she could reply he had dashed off, but quickly returned and waited for her reply, like nothing happened. Well, I just think killing when you don't have to is wrong, most of my friends think the same, especially if the crime they commit doesn't warrant it, she said confidently. Watchdog man seemed to be mulling that over but momentarily whined at the hero who was puzzled for the moment, but she quickly understood what the hero wanted and tossed him the treat in her hand. As he was eating, Watchdog Man seemed to have a flash of an idea if his raised eyebrows were anything to go by. That or if he really liked the treat that Asui had today Dahlia mentioned how the snacks for the day were her favorite of the bunch. Maybe they were his as well. When he was done with his treat he looked at her again and began to speak again, shocking the girl how she didn't have to prompt him to speak up. Maybe I can't be more lenient but that doesn't mean you have to do as I do. Watchdog spoke, 
leaving the girl a little confused on what he meant. If you can capture and defeat the monster before I arrive, I would have no need to kill them. Deal? He droned on with some hint of sarcasm in his voice. Well it wasn't what she initially thought she would get from the man Asui was happy to get anywhere in this conversation of sparing monsters. Reaching into her pocket and grabbing a handful of treats to give to the hero for his offer, but that was when reality struck her hard as the hero dashed away in the blink of an eye, invisible to her senses and returned just as quickly while simultaneously snatching the treats she grabbed from her bag out of her hand as she thought on how she would ever get to a scene before this man in front of her. That's not fair, you're so much faster than I am, she said. Just get faster, was his simple reply, which ticked Asui off somewhat. Well, how did you get so fast, Asui questioned. Training, was all Watchdog Man said in return. Asui nearly gave up with her line of questioning but saw his body language subtly change his. His head began to raise and his body began to tense. She never noticed this before and figures this was him reading himself to charge out again into the city. She reacted quickly. Shooting out her tongue and attaching to Watchdog Man's back. He launched off the platform and began to run, but Sue's only clue that anything was happening was the feeling of being weightless and suddenly coming to a stop sometime later. She let herself recover from her mental debilitation and she caught up to the scene that was happening in front of her. There was a strange being in front of the two heroes. It was like a reptilian creature with horns, extended mouth, large fangs and claws, with spiny dorsal fins on its back going down its spine. He had large webbed toes and a long tail. The creature looked at them and fear instantly grew on its features as its sights turned to Watchdog Man, who was sitting down patiently waiting. You get one freebie, was all Watchdog Man said as he sat completely still. Making a suey question about what he meant by that, did he let her hitch a ride on him? Before she could ponder the thought any more however the creature began to run away. You have ten minutes, Watchdog Man said as he laid down where he was gesturing for Froppy to follow the creature. She did immediately hopping after the creature which ran away. Its large bulk made him pass through the narrow alleys of the street slowly. She caught up in no time jumping in front of the creature halting its progress. Surrender, please. Asui seemed to almost beg the creature. It either didn't understand her or didn't want to listen to her as it charged forth thrusting its claw at her which she narrowly avoided. She crawled up the side of the alleyway and dropped down with a dropkick that caught the creature in the chest, but the attack barely budged the behemoth. Now up close Froppy could tell that the creature was much bigger than she thought double her height and width easily. She jumped away as another came down towards her ripping into the sides of slowing the blow down allowing her to jump out of the way towards the upper part of the alley again and camouflage. The creatures roared in challenge and stroke where she was with its long tail forcing her to dodge out of the way and then recloak somewhere else, but the tail continued to almost land spot on each time. Please, you don't understand I'm trying to save your life. Ribbit! She hopped away from another tail strike. She used her hand to gather mucus and throw the substance at the creature, but the mucus had no effect which shocked her. She puzzled on what she could do before the creature leaped at her. She managed to dodge but the tail caught her mid-leap and struck her to the ground. The creature clinging to the wall jumped down at her its claws ready to pierce through her body. She was helpless to avoid the attack but before the creature could land she saw a flash of movement and suddenly the creature's blue blood rained down from the sky above her some droplets touching her face. It was completely bisected in half by Watchdog Man, who still maintained his stoic expression. Time's up, was all he said as he made his way from the alley leaving a stunned Asui behind. She didn't know what to say at the moment or how she felt about the situation. Whatever that creature was it was definitely different from what Jordan is. It could have been originally some animal maybe. Can animals become monsters? It would make sense why she couldn't speak to it. If it was an animal then I guess its death was for the best. Releasing something like that into the wild could have dramatic ramifications to the wildlife or any unlucky passerby. Either way it didn't matter now. But next time hopefully she could spare someone else from such a fate of this creature, she thought as she walked from the alleyway. What goes up must come down, Tatsumaki, Yuraraka. Yuraraka was once again in their training field between cities. She was going through her and Tatsumaki's equal usual training regime with her trying to throw heavier and heavier rocks at the girl while dodging around return fire from the mystical hero. 
The rocks this time around were heavier than she was used to if she had to guess they were all around 40 tons each which meant she couldn't hold that many at a time, but she was determined to at least land one hit on the flying hero if she could. Although given that the rocks she uses and that are around her were all created by Tatsumaki, she didn't know how she would be able to land any blow on the girl without having it just be redirected back at her. These Asper's powers as this universe calls, it seemed to be incredibly strong and hold great utility. She couldn't spare any more thought on the matter as she quickly dived out of the way rocks that were thrown at her, the shockwave sending her further than she initially planned. As she began to stand up to fight again, she found that she was surrounded by many small pebbles with no room to evade or dodge. She then looked up to the flying girl in defeat. Let's try to spice things up a little, I'm starting to get bored again, Tatsumaki said as the rocks around Yuroraka dropped towards the ground. Yuroraka shook herself from the dust that quickly clung to her suit and looked ready for what came next. What do you have in mind, she questioned. This was Tornado's only reply, as she snapped her fingers and a small green aura surrounded Yuroraka, and she immediately fell to the ground feeling an invisible nearly crushing weight stopping her from moving and barely being able to breathe. She feels as her chest is getting crushed into the ground, she feels her bones shake and vibrate under the strain, and her head is nailed to the ground no matter how hard she tries to lift it. She thinks she hears the hero in the sky say something but her ears had long since popped muffling most of the sounds she heard around her as she focused on only still breathing. The sudden pressure suddenly releases to her utter relief. She tries to stand up, but her knees buckle from the sudden movement, and she is only able to flip around on her stomach, looking towards the sky to a very dissatisfied Tatsumaki looking down at her. Really? You can't even handle ten times gravity? Tatsumaki said with a huff. You can increase gravity? Yuraraka said through a ragged breath. I just said that, didn't I? Let me know when you're ready," Tatsumaki said drifting away somewhat while in a relaxed position. Yuraraka took her moment to catch her breath. She tested her body seeing if there was strain in moving her legs or arms. Once satisfied she started to stand up and turned to face Tatsumaki. Finally done with your nap? Tatsumaki said sarcastically. I'm ready, but maybe you could go a little easier? Yuraraka let out a small chuckle while rubbing the back of her neck only receiving an eye roll from the floating hero in return, before she lit up green again and felt the same feeling as last time, but thankfully much much milder. How much higher did you raise it, this time? she asked, feeling the effects even on her mouth as she had to use more strength to form the words she wanted to say. Only two, I was debating three times but might as well work our way up, Tatsumaki said, twirling her hand in an unimpressed manner. Well I thank you for that. Yuraraka replied bashfully. Yeah, yeah, whatever, just get ready, don't worry about trying to fight back, just worry about moving. Tatsumaki said as she gathered around a number of small rocks around her ready to attack. Wait, wait you're not gonna even give me Tai. The rest of her statement died in her throat as Tatsumaki sent the rocks flying her way. Yuraraka jumped out of the way and felt herself pulled towards the ground incredibly faster than she expects barely avoiding the rocks behind her. She sprung into a combat role and kept running as rocks kept landing behind her. She felt herself tire much more quickly than she would have thought. Tatsumaki made her evasion harder by completely changing the landscape around her such as slightly racing glowering platforms in front of her, blocking off pathways, or pulling roots up from the ground to trip her up. This multitasking focus on the environment combined with the increased gravity caused Yuraka to get hit far more often than she would have normally the blows were not as hard hitting as she would have expected she assumed Tatsumaki was still going easy on her, slowing the rocks as they neared her body. Now instead of a punch to the gut that were the hits before, they felt like a playful jab. It was still painful but not enough to completely halt her momentum. They continued to train like this for some time before Tatsumaki stopped her attack and picked the girl up, along with a couple of the larger rocks which hinted to Yuraraka that they were going back into some city again to fight monsters. She was finally dropped down into the city, instead of a park. However it seems that they were in an abandoned park. The alarms were blaring again with multiple threat-level wolf threats being around. Tatsumaki only said to deal with this and left the heroine alone again flying off into the distance. Yuraraka was at first was confused on where she should go, 
Everyone seemed to have already evacuated, and she couldn't hear anybody screaming to let her know where the monsters are until suddenly a large buzzing filled her ears quickly turning, she tried to dodge the large stinger aimed ripped at her. She successfully did so but her suit was partially cut by the surprise strike, she realized that the gravity effect was still on her, which meant that Tatsumaki was either close by or her range of control was phenomenal. But we immediately drew her attention to the giant mosquito in front of her. She nearly yelped at the sight of the creature. It was nearly human-sized. She immediately cursed her luck as it separated her from the rocks Tatsumaki brought with her. The mosquito flew at her again diving right for her face. Using her enhanced gravity to her advantage, she ducked quickly under the attack and rolled back towards he weapons. She quickly used her quirk on the rocks and hefted the rocks, but as she turned back around she noticed three more nearly human-sized mosquitoes next to the one that she dodged she mentally sighed. Of course there would be more of them. There always are she thought. She threw rocks at two of them, but they dodged out of the way and charged at her. She dodged again as she picked up more rock and threw them. This back and forth went by numerous times before she finally managed to land a hit on one, putting it down for the count. She began to run away as the other three charged at her with renewed passion trying to skewers her, she managed to dodge two of them while using her gunhead martial arts to grapple the third and slam it into the ground using one of her rocks on top of it to knocking it out. She turns in time to twist her body out of the way of another piercing stab that sliced her costume around the waist. She backed up to view her surroundings. She noticed that one of the bugs were missing and quickly turned upwards to look at it quickly seeing that the other mosquito was diving down head first at her. She quickly raised her one of her rocks to block the strike which it did, crumpling the stinger the creature had and it flopping around before beginning to fly away from the scene. The other mosquito charged forth again but stopped mid-charge to strike laterally across your avity chest. She sidestepped the stinger but was hit by its legs instead she decided to roll with the blow to create distance and threw another rock at the bug, but it quickly flew to the side to avoid the rock. Yoraka had used her quirk on the creature and due to its newfound unbalance couldn't recover in time as it slammed directly into metal gate, tangling it up as it struggled to move. Yoraka was done and took account of the damage she incurred other than a few cuts here and there to her uniform. She was fine but that left what to do with these bugs she wondered. But her thoughts were interrupted as Tatsumaki floated down next to her. Sloppy, she said as she floated down with one of the paralyzed insects in stasis. You let one get away, do better next time. I won't be around to clean up your messes forever you know. She chastised as she snapped her fingers and all of the mosquitoes whirled into a tornado of nothingness. Yuraraka didn't really feel bad for them either, mosquitoes were just a menace to society, giant ones even more so but she turned to address Tatsumaki's comment. It flew away. What do you expect me to do? Float after it? Yuraraka reasoned. Not liking the snarky reply she received from the girl, she increased the gravity on her to four times, causing Yuraraka to fall to her knees. I expect you to do better, she yelled as she lifted her away and flew off, towards their training area again. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 6. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Also check out the story and author Lumpy Spark 3 on fanfiction.net. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.